whole affair was a very little known one and it deals with um, an equally controversial case that of a, a 1950s contactee named Truman Betherum um, who claimed sort of like flirty nighttime en encounters with this sort of hot space alien woman named Captain Aura Rains of a non-existent planet called Clarion which is supposedly on the other side of the of the sun but of course it isn't <laughs> and um and basically um Bethram, you know as i said claimed all these encounters at a place called mormon mesa in nevada although a lot of people dismiss his story it actually has like a lot of aspects to it that are more in line with like a hypnopompic hypnagogic type experience i don't think it's coincidental as i point out that you know this exp or these experiences with this so-called captain or ranger who's going to take him away this faraway space world were happening at the time he was going through bad times with his wife which ultimately ended in divorce so i think it was i don't actually think it was a hoax i think it was like a, a fascinating case in sort of psychology psychology that it's someone like a psychiatrist would have a great time evaluating now, well, Nick, would you dead. suggest, let me ask you here, Nick, would you suggest then that perhaps Bethram was dreaming about his encounters with Aura Reigns? Well, dreaming not in the sense of a regular dream, but almost, you know, like, I mean, I don't believe he was hoaxing. I don't think he was just, he had an occasional dream. I think it was more of, he was in such a stressed out state with his divorce coming up and things like that, that he actually found himself sort of retreating subconsciously into this fantasy world that got more and more convoluted and complex as time went on. And, you know, to where he actually began to believe it and his subconscious filled in the gaps. Possibly, I think, as a way to try and make life easy for him, you know, um, his subconscious sort of kicked in, you know, kind of in a very different way, but in a similar way that when somebody sees a car accident, something like that, a very bad one, Often they can't remember it afterwards. That's his subconscious protecting you. I think it may have been um, Betherum's way of that help continuing. And again, I don't think it's a coincidence that his wife, number three, <laughs> after he uh, divorced that one, her name was Alvira Roberts, which is, you know, same initials, Aura Reigns, Alvira Roberts. So I think there's like a classic case of, you know, that would, a, a psychologist who didn't, wasn't aware of the case would, would pick this story to pieces but from the perspective of finding a fascinating case study but for all that said Bethram's story called a border flying saucer was published in 1954 and he told of meeting captain aura Rains and you know the, the rest of the crew so to speak on one occasion out of seven or eight actually very close to kingman and contrary to what you know a lot of the contactees were saying at the time that you know, they were sort of six to seven foot tall, blonde haired space brother types. Bethrooms weren't. They were like, they looked like us. They had olive colored skin. They were sort of four to five feet tall, wore these sort of tight fitting uniforms and skull caps. Now, that is exactly what several of the Kingman witnesses to the crash door reported years later, most prominently Arthur Stansel, who said the body he saw was small, wearing a skull cap with an olive colored skin, etc., etc. Now, now, let me ask you a question here. Is it possible that Stansel's remembrances of the case or stories about the case were based on what he remembered from reading the book by Truman Bethram? Oh, yeah, that, that's entirely possible. You know, it could be that one is embroidered upon the other. By Stansel's own admission, because he told the story originally to two young UFO researchers, literally like young teenagers at the time, by his own admittance, he was on like his fifth martini when he started telling the story. That was an and, interesting point here, that when he began to tell these stories, each martini would help him to further embellish the details. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, when he told the story to Ray Fowler, like three years later or two years later, he admitted that he was under the influence, you know, of these martinis at the time. And he actually told a very different story to, to Fowler that he told to these two kids. For example, in the story told to Fowler, the thing that came down at Kingman was like a, a 25 to 30 foot disc. He told the two kids that it was like a streamlined piece of fuselage, about 12 feet long, which is very different, you know. And it's difficult to sort of reconcile how somebody over the course of two years can mistake a 30-foot saucer for a 12-foot to 15-foot piece of fuselage, like an aircraft fuselage. But, you know, if you go back and look at the historical record, that's exactly what he said. In saying all that as well, you know, Stansel wasn't some fantasist 
I mean, he had a, a very strong, good background. You know, he, he was actually in the Second World War. He, you know, was involved in the Normandy landings. After the war, he, you know, he, he had major scientific credentials. He worked with the Air Force. He worked with the Atomic Energy Commission. So, you know, he's not somebody who made up a background or, or even one that was open to question. Was anyone able to verify his background, that that's what he was? Oh, yeah. I've got, I mean, I've got a file. on The reason I wrote the Kingman article and also a lengthier paper for a, a book that New Page Books put out last year, is I've got like a four-inch thick file on the Kingman play on the Kingman case. I could, you know, if I wanted to, I could do an entire book about it. Um, and yeah, there's absolutely no doubt who he who he is, who he was. You know, I've got photographs of his grave, and you know, which sort of celebrates his life and everything else. And uh, you know, it's yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that he was who he who he claimed to be. That's now, the interesting thing I worry about, intriguing. though, the thing I worry about, though, Nick, is I'd like to see what was in those martinis. <laughs> that each successive martini would bring forth more and more fascinating revelations about what might have happened to Kingman. But if we follow what Harry Drew is saying, it wasn't just one crash or crash landing. It was several. I want to ask you if you know more about that in a moment. We have Nick Redfern. He is, of course, an author and commentator. He's covered 14 events for a number of years, author of many fascinating books, and I'll tell you about some of them very shortly. Chris O'Brien's on assignment with Gene Steinberg and Nick Redfern. You're in... The Paracast. Ho, ho. Hey, neighbors, you've seen all those crazy, wacky products on TV. The perfect tortilla, easy covers, hot booties, furniture fix, petty spin, and more. Where do you find all that stuff? You go to asseenontv.com because this is the one-stop source for all of these TV goods advertised. Find all your favorites as seen on TV. Check them out as seen on TV.com. And by the way, save 10%. Here's what you do. Use the code SEEN1, S-E-E-N number one, SEEN1. Go to asseenontv.com to order. Save 10%. Purchase this summer's hottest As Seen on TV items. Save 10%. Or call 1-866-277-3366, one 866 The code seen one to save 10 percent what's going on with food prices have you noticed how your favorite ice cream is now 14 ounces instead of a pint round trip airfares into nine major cities has increased 44 percent in just one year ask your 18 to 25 year old what it costs to buy some nice fashionable jeans 300 dollars and yet not one person in a hundred realizes these prices reflect government spending and federal reserve bank dollar printing Gold in the last 10 years has increased 450%, while the dollar's purchasing power is declining daily. My name is Daniel Larson. I work at Midas Resources. To learn more about how gold and silver can protect your dwindling purchasing power and your IRA accounts, call 1-800-686-2237, extension 134. That's 800-686-2237, extension 134. Daniel Larson, 800-686-2237, extension 134. What's safer and cheaper than prescription drugs? Glad you asked. The answer is Renovation Teas. Herbal remedies are much safer and much cheaper than prescription drugs. Taste great, and most importantly, herbal teas are effective and non-addictive. Renovation Tea is especially unique, and here's why. We spent years researching herbs and their beneficial properties. Renovation Teas uses only 100% organic, fair trade herbs. Our teas are blended towards specific ailments and health conditions, such as diabetes, blood pressure, anxiety, libido, detox, and much more. All Renovation Teas are formulated and hand-filled in Arkansas. Take care of yourself naturally, the way Mother Nature intended. Order Renovation Teas at RenovationTea.com or call 870-784-3121. That's 870-784-3121. Renovation Tees. Renovate your health one bag at a time. 
Healthy soils grow healthy plants. So before you plant your survival garden this year, is your soil healthy? Maximize your crisis garden soil with EM1 from Terraganics. EM1 organic soil conditioner, fertilizer amendment, and compost accelerant provides healthier gardens and faster, efficient garden composting. EM1 from Terraganics.com quickly improves soil structure by increasing nutrient availability and converting organic matter into soil humus. This improves seed germination and root growth, improves plant quality, size, color, flavor, nutrient value of fruits and vegetables and improves shelf life. And when rain is not in the forecast, no worries. EM1 improves moisture retention in soils, helping reduce drought stress. Just like you prepare all else, prepare your crisis garden for maximum yields with EM1 from Terraganics.com. Order now at T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Terraganics, life's getting better. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Nick Redfern serving double duty. He is both guest and guest co-host. Chris O'Brien's on assignment preparing to present a lecture at a UFO convention. In any case, we are exploring what might be going on in Kingman, Arizona in 1953. Now, Harry Drew told us when he was on the show last week that there were three events consisting of one landing, a disabled UFO, and two crashes. And I have to point out, as some of our listeners might have realized in listening to last week's show, I was, quite frankly very confused about the presentation because he had difficulty separating the events and I couldn't follow them very well. So, Nick, we're talking about a single event when we remember this particular guy, this Arthur Mm. Stansel. But what about the story about other UFO events in 1953 in Kingman? Well, you know, I mean, I don't know anything specific about any other crashes. I mean, I can tell you that, you know, Truman Betterham's case you know, just literally on the fringes of, of Kingman in the same, roughly the same era, was described as a landing. You know, he described as a landing as opposed to these aliens getting out. Whether that ties in, you know, I don't know. But what I can say, and this, you know, this place is a very different angle on it, is that Stansel was attached to the Atomic Energy Commission. He was also involved in the Atomic Energy Commission series of atomic bomb tests that were going on in Nevada at the time. Uh, which had the code name of Operation Upshot Knothole. That was, that was the name of the program. And it's a very fine declassified program now. A lot of the files have been made available. One of the interesting things about, you know, this case is, of course, Nevada borders Arizona. In terms of aviation, you know, the, the distance from the Nevada testing ground to Kingman isn't that far, really. You know, it's only one state away at the best of times. One of the missions that we know went ahead during this upshot not whole program was it was actually it was actually a secret thing at the time. The um, Air Force reconverted several of its fighter planes so they could load monkeys on board. These monkeys they were basically drone aircraft. They were radio controlled from the ground and they were flown through the mushroom clouds to try and determine how pilots could be protected from radiation exposure in the event of like a nuclear attack or a nuclear war. And so they had these chimpanzees, sorry, chimpanzees, not monkeys, dressed in sort of flight suits, kind of like, you know, when the chimpanzees were sent into space. They had little flight suits, skull caps, and they were sat in the aircraft, go through the mushroom cloud, and they'd bring them back and just monitor them over the next few days and weeks to see, you know, if the protective clothing, they put one in, you know, and the other, another one they didn't put much on him, and the other one they left him naked, you know, and it was to see if, how they would be affected by exposure. Now, there is a story about one of these aircraft going off course and crashing and being the subject of security and, and cover-up, etc. not so much because it was any advanced technology, but simply because if anybody, you know, from the Soviets or whatever got wind of what was going on, they would know that experiments were being done to determine how successfully American troops could survive, you know, a Russian attack. So there was a secrecy angle. Now, when you look at that, if we look at that story, if one of these fighter planes crashed and he had one of these chimpanzees on board in his little flight suit and skull cap and the aircraft broke up and the body was found inside the fuselage, 
that would actually go along very well with Arthur Stansel's original story about a small body and a piece of wreckage that was fuselage shaped and silver, which would, you know, would tie in with an aircraft. The very fact that Stansel was attached to this atomic energy bomb test program, you know, where, where the chimpanzees were used, is even more intriguing. I have to wonder if the whole thing is a distortion of a very real event in which a, in which a, a, a semi-classified vehicle crashed and that did have a small body on board and that was subject to official secrecy. Now, again, by Stansel's own admission, he was initially told and wrote in his own diary, I actually have copies of his diary from that, that entire period. His diary actually says that he was initially told that this was a secret U.S. experimental aircraft that had come down. And he said it was only later that he was told it was a UFO. So, you know, if you look at the initial story, I think it's quite explainable. You know, but the, but the weird thing is, if that is really what happened, you know, it's like, well, did Truman Bethlehem get wind of what had happened as well and embroidered that into his 1954 book? And if he did, how did he do it? You know? Well, the thing I also wonder about here is how did one event become three? Well, the only thing I could say is that it's like an aircraft crash. I mean, if, let's just hypothesize that something did come down, land, crash, crash land. You know, it's very seldom that unless some, a big lumbering plane goes vertically into the ground, you know, you often do find material spread over at different sites. I mean, for example, you know, where I grew up in Britain, you know, in 1988, we had the terrorist attack that blew up a jumbo jet over Scotland, and, you know, which came down at a place called Lockerbie, a little town. But wreckage was found all over the place and for months afterwards. You know, so in that sense, depending on the height of the object, the speed, whatever, did it explode in the air? You know, you could conceivably have more than one site. You know, if something broke up, but somebody managed to sort of glide part of the vehicle down, you know, that, that's a possibility. Basically, therefore, the fact that there are multiple areas where the wreckage was found could create the climate for expecting this to be multiple events rather than a singular event. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you know, if you've got somebody out in the desert who... Fought, well, I mean, let's just hypothesize that it's a UFO and it breaks up in the air. Well, if two-thirds of it come down in one area, then you have a, you know, part of it gets blasted out and, you know, just sort of comes sprinkling to the ground and then a body's found somewhere else, you know, and you've got rumors about the military securing one site and another, kind of like Roswell, really. You know, it's like, regardless of what happened at Roswell or didn't, you know, most researchers agree that there were at least sort of several sites of whatever it was. You know, even the mogul balloon people, you know, sort of forced to agree that it didn't all come down in one place. Now, um, the one thing you know, about Kingman, in addition to that, is it doesn't seem to be as widely accepted as Roswell. I know, for example, Kevin Randall doesn't believe mm -hmm. in Kingman, I think largely because of his suspicions about Arthur Stansel and the fact that his story changes with the number of martinis yeah. he consumes. No, you're right. I mean, I think there's two things you can say about um, Kingman that aren't in its favor. Well, not so much in its favor. One's not, definitely not in its favor, and that's um, Stansel's change in story. The other thing that is not so much not in its favor, but it's, it's been underreported. One of the things I've found is a lot of researchers actually have stories relative to Kingman of varying credibilities. Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt had one. Um, there was the original one from Ray Fowler that, you know, ultimately surfaced from these two UFO kids. Um, Leonard Stringfield got hold of a number of stories, um, allegedly of UFO crashes in Arizona in April 53. You know, this is one month before Kingman, uh, but it wasn't specified as Kingman. Other a guy named Bill Uhouse, uh, sort of a guy who claimed to have been employed at Area 51, said he knew about the Kingman story and said there were four alien bodies, not one. So, in other words, there are, it's, a, it's an interesting story because there are actually, when you dig into it, a lot of leads. And it's know, not and depending, got, then, Nick, on one person who may or may not have imbibed too much before he starts to remember these things. Chris O'Brien is on assignment this week over at the UFO Con. 2012 in Santa Clara, California. He'll be reporting about that and lots more next week. You're with Gene Steinberg and our guest co-host and guest, Nick Redfern. You're in... Paracast. Ha ha. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are... 
the GCN Radio Network. If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first-class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one-click web apps such as WordPress, 24-7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to DreamHost.com slash radio, DreamHost.com slash radio. Fateback. Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fate Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. What's better than Mountain House freeze-dried food? Buckets of Mountain House freeze-dried food. Now the freeze-dry guy introduces convenient, easy-to-store Mountain House survival buckets filled with our top-selling items. Each item is sealed in a Mylar-type pouch, and each pouch is neatly packed in clear buckets so you can easily see the contents inside. These Mountain House survival buckets come with well over a 25-year shelf life and are perfect for emergency preparedness, camping, backpacking, or at-home use. Go to freezedryguy.com, click on freeze-dried foods, and choose our 12-month, 6-month, 3-month, 1-month, or or seven-day Mountain House Survival Bucket with 32 generous servings starting at just $69.95. And all orders to the lower 48 ship free. Call 866-404-3663 or go to freezedryguy.com. That's 866-404-3663 or go to freezedryguy.com. 100% veteran-owned. The Freeze Dry Guy. My name is Gary Johnson. Today I reach out to you, members of all political parties. I reach out to everyone with a vote and an axe to grind. I ask you to join me in trying something that's never been attempted before in America. Let's put our parties and our differences aside one time. Be libertarian with me for one election. Together, we'll stop the spending and end the wars. Together. We'll rebuild our own roads, bridges, schools, and hospitals instead of building theirs half a world away. Together, we'll restore our industrial might and our economy. And if, in four years, we as a people decide we don't like peace, prosperity, and freedom, we can always vote failure back into office again. We the people live free. Gary Johnson, Libertarian for President. Paid for by Gary Johnson, 2012. Since 1974, Evelyn Gibson has helped thousands of people live healthier, happier, and more productive lives. Gibson'sHealth.com demonstrates, educates, and inspires customers to replace their healthy roast of lifestyles with a health-enhancing one. Now, Gibson'sHealth.com is pleased to offer AIM Ready Beets Pure Juice Powder. Beet juice has long been known as a blood purifier and builder of red blood cells. The American Heart Association says one in three adults has high blood pressure and hypertension. Researchers found that a daily glass of beet juice beats high blood pressure. And not only that, just a teaspoon or two a day of Ready Beets powder increased stamina by 16%. Certainly, drinking beet juice daily is a better solution than most meds with their side effects. Order your fresh, convenient form juice powder of this amazing vegetable called Ready Beets from GibsonsHealth.com. To buy at wholesale prices, call 800-388-6844 or go to GibsonsHealth.com. Gibson's Healthful Living. Since 1974, over 30,000 healthier customers. Southern, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. I'm Nick Redfern, joining us as a guest and guest co-host. Chris O'Brien's on assignment, and we're going to have a wide-ranging discussion about the future of ufology and a few other things, but we wanted to start with some remembrances about the evidence with regard to Kingman, Arizona, whether there were UFO crashes there. And, of course, Harry Drew has done some extensive investigation in recent years and part of the problem as we always encounter here as you know nick when you're trying to put together pieces of something that happened 59 years ago Mm. and you don't really have direct witnesses necessarily alive anymore and maybe there wasn't a newspaper story about it it's pretty difficult to put things together well you're right and that's why you know some of these cases 
go from being a case of something having happened to essentially a piece of folklore because there are you know a lot of different leads and strands and inevitably then different theories and ideas develop you know i would arguably say that roswell's already gone into that category because you know with roswell even though you know there are countless people who've come forward most of them are now gone so now it's down to sort of turf war and upholding this theory or that theory because we're at stalemate, you know, and even the government admits, well, we looked for files and we couldn't find any. You know, it's like contrary to what people think, the government didn't say, oh, we found files on Mogul that prove it was that. They said, well, we didn't find anything, but that's what we think it is. I think that's where we're at with Kingman. It's, for all intents and purposes, it's 60 years old, you know. For that reason, arguably, there's probably nobody left, you know, other than, you know, if you had a bunch of sort of 20-year-old kids guarding the site of whatever it was, well, they're going to be 80. You know, who's to say that they're still fully functioning in the mind anyway? Well, I hope so, I'm fully functioning in the mind at 80, and I certainly look to Jim Mosley at 81 as an example of somebody who is fully functioning, yeah. at least in terms of his intellect, so I guess it's possible. But this is not then a cold case, but a frozen case in most respects. Well, um, it is in the sense that, you know, how do we take it further? I, I think if it was sort of like an aircraft with chimpanzees on board, and if they, before people rolled their eyes, you know, I've got those files from the National Archives proving that those experiments occurred in May 53 as a part of the atomic energy program. That and, of course, that's when the crash has occurred at Kingman, supposedly, May 1953. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, for that reason, we are at stalemate. But, I mean, if that angle, we, we still can be, uh, potentially might be able to take that further. As far as the UFO angle is concerned, you know, I mean, it's like any crash case that we just never get documentation confirming it. You know, we get confirmation of something having happened, but with the crashes, they never go any further. And, you know, I'd be surprised if this one did, you know, it's just... It, it, the further it goes on, the more it becomes folkloric. And I don't mean by that the people lying, but it just becomes a piece of Americana or whatever, you know. Basically, then, unless Harry Drew can produce a miracle, this may be just another cold case that we can talk about, but maybe never well, get to the bottom of. Well, uh, you know, I mean, something may turn up one day. Uh, my, my view on all these crashes is that something probably will turn up if they were anything but a UFO crash. You know, it's like if they were a UFO crash, well, the government's not going to tell us anyway. But if they weren't, but they were some sort of classified program, then I think there actually is one day a chance of something, you know, surfacing into the public domain. I mean, there was a story, you know, just a few months ago um, about a, a crash off Scotland of something in the early 60s, you know, which has all the ingredients of Roswell, sort of strange materials, the story hidden under a balloon cover. And, um, you know, it turned out to be um, sort of classified U.S. balloon-based payload-type situation. Um, but again, it, you know, it provoked all these rumors about the military cordoning off the site, which did happen. But it was, you know, it was finally exposed because it turned out to have a mundane explanation. And I think the less mundane, the less likely of getting the truth. The more mundane, but it's still hidden behind a, you know, a fantastic legend. But the more mundane, the, the bigger chance of, of getting the answers, I think. And you also have to think, if it was just a secret weapon of some sort, having it thought to be a UFO would actually keep the secret of what it really was. Well, I mean, it would. But I, I've never sort of been impressed with the idea of hiding stuff behind a crashed UFO. I, I can understand how people might believe it was a crashed UFO if from a distance they saw all this wreckage in a small body. I've never really understood the scenario of hiding it behind a UFO because arguably that attracts more attention. You know, it's like if it was a crashed aircraft at Kingman, we wouldn't be looking at it now if it wasn't for the UFO angle. So and I guess also the point being that if we were experimenting with disc-shaped aircraft back in the early 1950s, okay, it's 2012, who cares anymore? Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like Roswell. That's the one thing about Roswell you know, that the, even the Air Force never satisfactorily explained. You know, they said the weather balloon was a cover for a mogul story, but they sort of conveniently never really addressed the issue of why the Air Force initially said it was a flying disc. You know, if they'd, have, if they'd just first said it was a weather balloon, uh, but we hid it behind, you know, we, it was a mogul balloon, but we hid it behind a weather balloon scenario, that would be more plausible. But they've, they've never really explained that angle of why they first said it was a flying disc. You know, why not 
first say it was a weather balloon if you want to hide another balloon, you know. It sounds strange, or maybe some incompetence on the part of some public information person. There is, of course, one other crash I can mention very briefly. We've done a couple of shows on it. And that is the so-called Aztec crash. We had Scott and Suzanne Ramsey on the show. They came out with their book after all these years. Then we had Kevin Randall, who refuted everything, saying that the one or two real alleged witnesses were not credible. And mm -hmm. that's the beginning and end of it. What's your take? Well, yeah, I mean, it's like I think there's, there's even less, for me at least, evidence for Aztec than there is, you know, for Kingman. Um, but Aztec is a fascinating story because also, you know, it's, it is sort of perceived by many as being a major, you know, crashed UFO event. And even if it isn't, you know, it's an integral part of ufology. And some people say, well, if it's a hoax or it didn't happen, how could it be a part of ufology? But the fact is, you know, when the whole crashed UFO thing kicked off in the late 40s with Frank Scully, you know, this was a major part of flying saucer history. An activity at the time, you know, there was loads of stories flying around about crashed UFOs, many linked to um, Aztec. Now, one of the more controversial angles came from the late Carl Flock. Me and Carl, a lot of people don't know this, but we actually were going to write a book on Aztec, um, and it was going to be called Silas the Magnificent, because one of the main players in the story, or arguably the main player, was a guy named Silas Newton, who was like, you know, like a cross between. Um, a used car salesman and somebody who just milked you for every penny. You know, he, he had all these sort of fancy fake um, devices for locating oil, doodlebug type, you know, uh, technologies, that sort of thing. And, so it um, sounds like the character that you'd make into a movie. Well, you know? yeah, I mean, that was the whole point of the book. It was going to be about him, but with the, the cornerstone would be his involvement in this Aztec scam, if you like. But what was interesting is that Carl, back in 1998, actually um, had several meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, with a relative of Silas Newton, who provided, or not provided, allowed him to see um, Newton's journal from 1970 through 1971, which talked about Aztec. And in that journal, um, Newton talks about how on several occasions he was visited by people who he didn't identify, but he talks about them being government or military people, who told him they knew that the whole Aztec story was a scam, but they wanted him to keep telling it. Now this, okay. kind of, now, this kind of sounds interesting because this deals with an aspect of ufology that wasn't really popular or even discussed back then, namely disinformation. And yet Newton was talking about it in his journal in the 70s, and he said that the visit occurred in the early 50s, you know, where the Air Force or whoever it was wanted him to spread a fake story about crashed UFOs. And, of course, Carl speculated... You know, was it was this just Newton adding another layer to the hoax, or was it a case of an early disinformation program to hide something else, or a psychological warfare operation to scare the Russians into thinking we've got alien technology, you know, so we'll have the UFO researchers spread the story. Regardless, you know, it, it sounds like an early disinfo op, and that uh, Newton was brought in to help sort of perpetuate it. You know what, Leonardo DiCaprio should become the person who plays Silas Newton. I think that would be absolutely perfect. <laughs> okay, well, Chris O'Brien is on assignment, and we have a fun-filled session with Gene Steinberg and Nick Redfern. You're in... The Paracast. Ha-ha. <laughs> Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items. And entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast Jumbo Tote Bag, all sorts of t-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great t-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children. Stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. 
If you go to store.thepowercast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. That's what it sounds like when a burglar kicks in the door of a dark house that looks like no one is home. Don't let your home be the next target. Make it look like someone is home watching television with fake TV. Fake TV is a small electronic device that makes the same light as a real television. So from outside, it looks like someone is home watching TV. Fake TV plugs in just like a lamp on a timer, but is far more convincing to burglars. Fake TV deters burglars, costs far less than an alarm, and is highly recommended by numerous police departments. Use it anytime you're away from home. To order your fake TV for only $34.95, go to faketv.com or call 1-877-5-FAKE-TV. Each additional fake TV is only $29.95. So get one for you and one for a loved one for safety, security, and peace of mind for both of you. Call 877-5-FAKE-TV or go to faketv.com. Faketv.com, the burglar deterrent. Radio advertising on GCN, the Genesis Communications Network, is simple, affordable, and reaches millions. How do we do it? Let's break it down. First, the simple part. You tell us about your business. <laughs> then our expert radio copywriters write your copy. We hire professional voice talent. Hello there. I'm a professional announcer. And then produce your ad with just the right music and feel. <laughs> Voila. Simple. How affordable? 60-second ads on GCN are the most affordable national radio advertising rates, period. And that brings us to reach. Millions of people listen to GCN radio programs on over 700 AM and FM and XM stations and streaming audio live. That's it. A one-stop shop, creative radio ads, very affordable rates, millions of potential customers, and customer service that can't be beat. See our current list of satisfied advertisers at GCNlive.com. Then shoot us an email, advertise at GCNlive.com. Hello? Congratulations. For what? For losing all that weight. How'd you do it so fast? ASAP. ASA what? What's that mean? Are you ready to get as skinny as possible, as soon as possible, as simple as possible, and as sexy as possible? I'm listening. Then get with the ASAP program. It's real and it works. No smooth talk, no slick advertising, and no exaggerated claims of success. I've got to know more. Welcome to ASAP, as slim as possible. Whether you have 10, 20, or 50 pounds to lose, ASAP is your weight loss answer. ASAP targets the abnormal fat reserves and makes them available to be burned as fuel and contains no caffeine or hormones. Order ASAP at wholesale prices or join the team to share the business with others. Visit GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. Lose weight and look great with ASAP, as slim as possible. He does it. Well, he's one of the best who does the Paracast, other than Chris, of course, and Bryce Zabel and a few others who've tried. You know, maybe we should have a Paracast Bake Off, where everyone who says the Paracast tries, and then we have a contest, and our listeners decide who does it best. I know I want to be neutral because I like them all. You know, Chris is my good buddy, and Nick's my friend, and Bryce Zabel and all these other people who've done it. I don't want to say. We were focusing here on the early legends of UFO crashes, certainly in Kingman, Arizona, which maybe or maybe not deserves further investigation. Let's see what Harry Drew comes up with. And by the way, Chris is going to be talking to Harry in person at this UFO convention in Northern California, which is taking place probably by the time you hear the show, so we're not going to really mention it. And the key being, however, is that maybe Chris will get some more information that we can go on. You know, we have somebody here as a dedicated historian who wants to try to find out what's going on. Nick Redfern, let's discuss a couple of other subjects here. And one is you have a blog called Nick Redfern's World of Whatever. Mm. And you have some advice for ufologists. Before we go to the future of ufology, I want to go to this 10 best or worst list that you did. Ufologists do not do these things. Okay, so if you want to investigate UFOs, this is what you don't do. You can take it seriously or not. I'm going to read the 10 best list. And should I read from the bottom up, or the, does it matter? 
Oh, the, well, they're in no particular order. I just um, put them as I felt like doing them. So. Advice to ufologists in no particular order. Nick Redfern recommending the things you should not do if you want to be a UFO investigator. I'm going to listen because I don't do these things. You know, I don't claim to know anything. I'm just a talk show host. That way I can get away with saying anything. And people say, well, he's just an entertainer. Who cares? Nick Redfern. Number one, the mysterious middle initial. What are we talking about? Well, you know, that, it, that sort of deals for me with like the pompous side of things, of ufology, where, you know, it's like me, my, my middle name's David. You know, it's kind of like if I was to write a book where instead of putting Nick Redfern, it sort of becomes Nicholas D. Redfern. Kind of or, find all that a bit funny, where somebody who's used a particular way of using the name for years, they have a book out, and suddenly, you know, it becomes all formal and official. And like, that's going to make any difference whatsoever to the credibility or not of what they're writing about, because they put the first name, you know, at full length and insert a middle initial, you know. And the interesting like, thing here, the other effect I should mention, Nick, is that with the middle initial, you do it without the period, okay? That adds a special, I don't know, prestige to it or <laughs> something well, mysterious. The middle initial does have do period. That. But, I you know, there's some people who have middle like initials. You look like Nick Dreadfern. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people have actually names with middle initials that don't mean anything, like Forrest J. Ackerman, the famous sci-fi mm -hmm. personality and... Author and, yeah, somebody's always used it. That's fine. I yeah, Forrest J. Ackerman. Yeah, the J like, didn't stand for like anything. Harry nice S. Danger. Truman. Yeah, you know, Harry like S. Truman, the S in Harry S. Truman, the late president of the United States, didn't mean anything. It was a letter S. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, because it rolls off the tongue and people, you know, probably remember it, which, you know, I understand that. But for me, I still find, you know, kind of amusing that people... People do it thinking, oh, I've got a book, so I've got to do that. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's, it's like almost subconsciously required that you've got to put your name in full, and you've got to, if you've got a middle name, you've got to use it. Okay. Or what you can do, instead of saying Nicholas David Redfern, N. David Redfern. Well, that's even a bit more ridiculous. Isn't it? <laughs> I don't have a middle name. They didn't give me one. They gave my brother Wally a middle name, Wallace Herbert Steinberg. But when they came out with Gene, no middle name. Oh, well, I feel, oh, well. I feel slighted. Number two, no, letters the after the name. Letters after the name. Like, for example, I could say Gene Steinberg, B-L-T. That's, by the way, for <laughs> bacon, lettuce, tomato. Forget it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's like if you've got letters after your name in this discipline or that discipline, that's fine if the thing you're working on and investigating is relative to that particular area. But the whole point about the UFO mystery is UFO still stands for unidentified flying object, you know, and it's the U we really have to focus on, unidentified. So, in other words, if you have a background in, let's so we say, advanced propulsion systems, right? So let's say chemical rockets, you know, the, the early years of, um, of rocketry. Let's say you have a background in, in, you know, chemical rockets and whatever your letters are after your name, your accredited credentials in that field, you use them when you're talking about, you know, your research. Well, that's fine if UFOs are powered, you know, by chemical rockets. But if they're not, it has no relevance whatsoever and doesn't help your case. So that's my point. When we're dealing with a phenomenon that's definitively unknown, any sort of background or discipline is irrelevant. You know, it's kind of like if your background is in astronomy, what good is it if the phenomenon's interdimensional? You know, if you're a professor of astronomy and the phenomenon has nothing to do with outer space, but you're talking more about John Keel's window areas and portals where these things come through, why is it relevant? Well, the answer is it isn't. So letters are fine when you're working in an identified realm and those letters are relevant to it. But when they're not, well, why even mention it, you know? <laughs> Number three, the ufological dress code. Now, I assume this is not wearing a black suit with special black sunglasses, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, again, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt. You know, I don't care what people wear when they're on a, you know, on a lecture circuit or doing TV or whatever. It doesn't bother me in the slightest as long as they're being true to themselves. That's one of the things, you know. It's, it's this case where people 
on the lecture circuit on TV, they feel they've got to sort of live up to this image or that image. Do you know what I mean? It's like, why? It's well, showbiz, baby. It's showbiz. Well, even if it is, you can still be yourself, you know. I mean, I've seen conferences where it's less about the data and more about the presentation and pauses in the right place to get an, an applause, the crisp suit, the nice white shirt, the freshly ironed tie, polished shoes, which is fine if that's who you are. But, you know, don't stand in the front of the mirror for three hours preparing a speech like you're running for president. You know, I'll tell you what, I think difference. there are a few UFO researchers who do this. I won't name them. It's not going to make any difference because, for one reason, you're talking about UFOs. You're not talking about balancing the budget or reducing crime or whatever. You're talking about aliens and, and UFOs and flying saucers. So, in other words, whatever you wear matters not one bit because it's the data that matters. And, of course, most people don't care and think it's all nonsense. So however many rows of neckties you've got, it matters not one little bit. Okay. Number four, saying the right thing to the allegedly influential people. Tell me more. Oh, uh, yeah. Kissing the ufological ass, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I do a lot of conferences, and, I, and I, unfortunately I see that a lot. Not where, you know, where... I can tie, you know, the entire UFO research community, and it's not even anywhere near, I would say, 10%. It's a very small percentage, but when it happens, you know, it's just embarrassing that, you know, I've seen, I've been to conferences where I know what one or two of the speakers vehemently disagree with some of the views of the conference organizer, but they won't bring that up in the lectures. You know, I actually know a couple of people who specifically left a certain part out, which was basically commenting on one controversial case that they thought was complete nonsense and the host was actually a, a champion of and they they omitted it from their lecture you know which to me is like disgraceful you it's know, being it's politically like, correct or incorrect well yeah it is but you should you shouldn't be if you're being politically correct by sanitizing your lecture well then you're an idiot and being politically incorrect well, I don't actually think it is that. I think it's just saying what you think, you know. And if somebody happens to disagree, well, big deal. It's not the end of the world. That's what we're, we're here to investigate and research, not uphold somebody else's view because you want to be invited back next year and get your, your $300 fee or whatever. It's not worth the $300. Now, I'm not going to ask you to use a certain word in number five because of the obvious reasons of commercial radio, but creating an image of, don't talk to me, I'm a famous ufologist, which is kind of like, don't talk to me, I'm a star. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something I see surprisingly often behind the scenes at UFO conferences, you know. I mean, you know, I like to go to conferences and sit in the audience, you know, and, um, you know, just because you're a UFO author, it doesn't mean you don't want to hear the other lectures or meet a ufologist you've never met before, you know what I mean? It's, it's cool to do that, and I like to take books along and get them signed like anybody else you, you want know, to be a I'm, member of the audience you want to be a normal person you want to be a yeah. mensch you don't want to be somebody who comes across with a star attitude well, no, or maybe you have an entourage that follows you and listens and hangs on your every word well yeah, by the way we hang on every word from nick redfern because he's cool and we're talking about and this is five so far, the things ufologists should not do. Ufologists do not do these things. Chris O'Brien's on assignment. I'm Gene Steinberg, and we have our guest co-host, Nick Redfern. You're in the Paracast. Ha, 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 ha. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com.
Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. That bears repeating. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. And Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse is the key to digestive health. Pro-EM-1 is a powerful liquid probiotic, strong enough to cleanse, gentle enough to use every day. Pro-EM-1 is dairy, wheat, and soy-free, contains all natural and certified organic ingredients, contains no preservatives or animal products, supports a healthy digestive and immune system, supports weight loss, improves absorption of food nutrients, aids in controlling yeast infections, is never freeze-dried, and uses three groups of live, viable, beneficial microbes to cleanse and remove toxins. Order Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse at Terraganics.com, spelled T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com, Terraganics.com. Or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Pro-EM-1, the raw probiotic. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. He's auditioning for the best recitation of the Paracast. You notice that? He does very well. Nick Redfern joining us as guest co-host, talking about a lot of things. We started out with UFO crashes such as Kingman, Arizona, and Aztec, and then we've moved to ufologists. Don't do this stuff, okay? Don't do it, okay? This is number six, and this, of course, is one that really, really upsets me because it's done so often. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a play on the words from... The X-Files, the truth is coming as opposed to the truth is out there. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were going to talk about the other one about um, don't talk to me, I'm a star. I kind of did it already. I thought we'd go past it. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's so obvious and implicit we don't need to get to it any further. But let's. The truth is out there or the truth is coming. Now, that one we hear all the time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, sort of take the view that this angle of the government's going to disclose and, you know, somebody's got insider sources who said it's coming, you know, a week next Thursday or whatever. You know, that's just not true. You can go literally back to the days of Donald Kehoe. He was told, you know, one of his books, I think it's Flying Source of Conspiracy, which exactly. was like 1953. Right. You know, he talks about how he supposedly had an insider source who told him, oh, you know, the government's going to reveal it all in the next few months. The same thing happened in the 60s. Ironically, in the FBI's 1,700-page FBI um, Freedom of Information file on UFOs, there's an anonymous letter in there where somebody contacted the FBI and said, I've been told by insider sources that the truth's coming. Is it really coming? And the FBI wrote back and said, you know, this isn't our jurisdiction. Then, of course, you know, with the MJ-12 stuff, people were saying, well, this is, you know, preparing the way for revelations, etc. Then you had the more sort of defined disclosure movement. And so in other words, pretty much since UFOs have been on the table, so to speak, people have been saying the government's going to reveal the truth. And it never comes. If people actually look back at the amount of times it's been said, people who sort of adhere to the disclosure movement might be actually shocked to learn this goes back 60 years and it resurfaces every four or five, six years. You know, I always wonder if Major Donald Kehoe were alive today, and he died, I guess, in the 1980s or something like that. He was born in 1897. I interviewed him in the 1970s. He was a pretty alert guy. And I never asked him this question. I kind of regret it now, I guess, because I didn't have the time. I would have wanted to say Major Kehoe, back in the 1950s, with the book The Flying Saucer Conspiracy, you thought the truth would be out there, it would be revealed, and now we're still talking and it's not happening. And years after Kehoe has left us, it's still not happening. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like the disclosure movement. I mean, that's, that's actually not new now. You know, that goes, that goes back like a decade or so. Disclosure in general, I mean, you know, the, the concept of it. You know, it, it's like it's going to be put off or it's going to be next year. It's going to be next year. Well, you know, how many next years does there have to be before this is just realized as the latest incarnation of 
the KL era or the MJ-12 thing when the documents were going to open the door to the next thing or whatever. Yes, it's like history repeating itself, repeating itself, repeating itself. <coughs> Number seven, it's E.T. forever. E.T., E.T. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I'm not saying that the UFO phenomenon isn't or parts of it aren't related to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. We don't have any proof that extraterrestrials are visiting the Earth. We have a hypothesis and a belief system that that's what's going on. Now, that may well be the case, but if we don't have proof, then for us to ignore all the different theories that exist beyond that is just stupid, you know, because it becomes, you know, like a, a Christian arguing with a Buddhist versus and a Hindu, you know, or whoever, you know, they all have their own religions. They clearly cannot be, all be correct because there are differences, sometimes major differences between all of them, yet they'll all say theirs is right. And it's kind of like that, that if you investigate it from the ET hypothesis, well, that's a very stupid thing to do because, you know, it's not the only one. So if you're going to investigate the ET angle, at least give equal space to the other scenarios and just see if they have a validity. You know, does the sort of the, the wormhole window area have, have validity? You know, does the time travel theory have validity? Does the paranormal or occult angle have validity? And if they do, if they don't, fine. But, do, but come to that conclusion because you've researched it, not just because you want to believe... It's E.T. E.T., go home. Go home. Yeah, I wish he would. Number eight, never turning off the I'm a ufologist switch. Just oh, mean yeah. I have to turn off the switch. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's, it's like the... I, I never really understand this, you know, the sort of obsession. I don't think this happens a lot, but I think it does happen, and sometimes it prominently happens where you have people who just cannot turn off from the subject and have a normal life away from it, you know, and do normal stuff. You know, it's like... People say to me, did you watch this show last night? Did you watch that? Well, no, I was watching American Idol, you know. Uh, oh, why were you watching that when there was a UFO show on? Because I like American Idol, <laughs> you know. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a hobby and an interest, but if you cross the line to where it impacts on your personal life to such an extent that you, you put off the normal stuff in life, the regular stuff that, you know, in, that makes a person healthy and vital and active, et, et cetera, then you have crossed the line, you know, and, um, and, and paranormal stuff, for whatever reason, that does happen. You know, I'm not, don't, as I said, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it happens to 90 or even 50% of the population that are involved in these fields, but it does happen to a significant percentage, you know, that people just get caught up and it takes over their lives, which, you know, is sort of sad and, and tragic as well. Well, all you can think of is UFOs. I try to be interested in other things. I also have a technology radio show, The Tech Night Out Live. I'm not all UFO folks. Maybe one-third UFO because I have the tech blog, Tech Night Out also. Bigfoot, well, number nine, number nine, nine with a bullet. Yeah, well, this is, you know, where you sort of have this sort of cross-pollination, if you like, where, um, you know, you can sort of take... Um, the big sort of hairy guy out the mix and replace it with ghosts or paranormal or the occult or whatever. It's basically where, with respect to UFOs, you have sort of this cross-pollination with other phenomena that, you know, neither party's researcher enjoys. I mean, a, a classic example, you know, Alistair Crowley conjuring up this sort of creature known as lamb, which all, apart from the eyes, looks almost identical to the thing on front of Whitley Strieber's communion. You know, but Crowley didn't summon this up or didn't... And, counter it, you know, with a visitation in nuts and bolts spacecraft in the woods, you know, he got in an altered state and basically invoked the thing, you know, and, and people in ufology don't like the fact that, well, this sort of goes down so-called hocus-pocus paths, you know, and no, we need nuts and bolts, this is just, this is going to sort of blow our credibility. So it's, it's basically that angle of where you have two paths crossing where neither research parties want it to cross it's not politically correct, again, to talk about Bigfoot in relation to UFOs. And no, no, no. It's like people who are interested in Bigfoot shouldn't talk to UFO researchers. But there's also this line of demarcation between people involved in science fiction. People who are science fiction fans, they have never gotten along with the UFO crowd. This is traditional. This is I've seen this over the years. And maybe because at least with science fiction, you say, look, it's just a story. It's fantasy. And now you're coming and telling me that E.T. or whatever is real. Who knows? Number 10, ufological worries. Worry me this. What's it about? Uh, you know, I forget. 
I forget which one that was, ufological worries. For all their desires to spread the ufological worded conferences on TV, on radio, and on the net, I have seen more than a few ufologists squirm and go bright red when they are forced Ah. to answer to people outside of their field the question of, so what do you do? Got it. Okay, yeah, I know. Do you want to I did that by the rum. No, I, I think it's fun that I read it. <laughs> well, all right, okay, cool. all right, well, I'll add my, my word to it. Yeah, I've never understood this angle of people being passionate about UFOs and standing up on the lecture circuit and, you know, having their say, etc., and, you know, in a commanding way telling the audience what they believe is going on. But then if they're at like a party at a friend's house or, you know, they just get chatting with someone. I've seen people squirm and just you know, not want to talk about it. It's like, well, you know, have a bit of strength of character, you know, don't don't be just sort of a, a you know, a total wuss that you're sort of, you don't even have the strength of character to support your own beliefs in something that you've, you know, spend a great deal of time investigating, you know. You I'll tell you what, we got to move this break. We have Nick Redfern. We've been talking a lot of fascinating stuff here, including the things ufologists shouldn't do. Ufologists do not do these things a 10 best or worst list. I'm Gene Steinberg. He's Nick Redfern. You're in the Paracast. Ho, ho. Hey, neighbors, you've seen all those crazy, wacky products on TV. The perfect tortilla, easy covers, hot booties, furniture fix, petty spin, and more. Where do you find all that stuff? You go to asseenontv.com because this is the one-stop source for all of these TV goods advertised. Find all your favorites as seen on TV. Check them out as seenontv.com. And by the way, save 10%. Here's what you do. Use the code SEEN1, S-E-E-N number one, SEEN1. Go to asseenontv.com to order. Save 10%. Purchase this summer's hottest As Seen on TV items. Save 10%. Or call 1-866-277-3366, 1-866-277-3366. The code Scene 1 to save 10%. Jim Newcomer from Midas Resources, September 14th, 2012. Gold opened this morning at 1771.10. A one ounce gold coin can be purchased for 1814.68, 907.34 for a half ounce, or 453.67 for a quarter ounce. That's 1814.68, 907.34, and 453.67. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? Wait a sec. Gold and silver is going up while Congress is trying to settle on the next debt increase. And there's no end to this madness. That old 401k and IRA can be converted into physical gold without tax consequences. I explain this in my book, 10 Reasons to Buy Gold. Don't let time slip away. Call for your free copy today, 800-686-2237. Get away from that Washington spin and get honest answers about gold. 800-686-2237. The book is free, 800-686-2237. Iodine protection packs from HempUSA.org are now in stock for immediate delivery worldwide. Our iodine protection packs include micro plant powder, green life kelp, red palm oil, and our clear roll-on iodine that will feed the body the iodine it needs. All iodine protection packs are in stock, save you money, and ship for free in all 50 states. Visit HempUSA.org or call 908-691-2608 today. HempUSA.org has a revolutionary wonder food for detoxing the body and rebuilding the immune system. Micro plant powder can help unclog arteries and soften heart valves while removing heavy metals, virus, fungus, bacteria, and parasites. Plus, it cleans and purifies the blood, lungs, stomach, and colon. Keep your body clean with micro plant powder. Visit us at HempUSA.org or call 908-691-2608 today. My name is Angie, and ever since my daughter had alternating diarrhea and constipation, she suffered from hair loss, listlessness, and was stunted in her growth. After getting her onto two supplements suggested by Nutripath Stephen Hewer, she has improved dramatically. Her stools have normalized, her hair and her body are growing again, and she is beaming. 
I credit the majority of her improvement to One World Whey. Children love the taste of One World Whey, and their growing bodies are getting nature's best source of protein. Evidence shows that non-denatured whey protein powder is a better source of protein than meat, milk, or eggs. If you have finicky children and you want a protein that will support their growth, energy, and healthy brain function, One World Whey is a must for you to try. Kids prefer it over junk food. Call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's OneWorld, W-H-E-Y.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Ho, 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 and a bottle of forget it. We have Nick Redfern joining us as guest and guest co-host. Chris O'Brien is on assignment this week. And we are going to talk about one or two more major topics before we go on. And this is an article you did for Mysterious Universe again called The Future of Ufology. And we have some questions about that from our audience, but I want to get into a description of what we're talking about here, the future of ufology. And I wonder about this because a lot of us got started early on. I won't say how many years ago, but I do remember Major Donald Kehoe as a physical living being because I met him several times. I do remember Ray Palmer. I never met Kenneth Arnold. I do remember Richard Shaver. I met him physically, as I did Jim Mosley, but Jim Mosley's still here. So what's the future of ufology? Well, it won't have a, a future in 100 years from now. I think, you know, providing we're around as a human race and there's still a civilization, I think there will be. And the reason why I think there will be is because if you look back at any mystery that's developed within human folklore or traditions, it still gets written about, talked about hundreds of years later, like fairies in the Middle Ages in England. You know, 600-year-old stories. Well, people still write books about fairies. You know, people still write books about Victorian table wrappings and, you know, seances. People are still writing about the 1897 airship scare. That's 115 years ago. Roswell's nearly 70 years ago. There's no reason, I think, why ufology won't be around in another 100 years because, you know, it's, it's sort of no time at all when you look at the way that some of these ancient mysteries are still being written about today. I guess my view is that unless there's a major breakthrough, which I don't believe there will be, and because there's something about 40 and phenomena that always keeps one step ahead of us and prevents us from, from actually getting to that truth. It kind of keeps us dangling on a string. So unless something major changes, I think it'll be pretty much like it is today. You know, in the same way people are asking questions, you know, if they hide to the airship scare in 1897 did a, an airship really crash at aurora texas and is the body buried in the cemetery you know that's 115 years ago and people are still asking that i think 100 years from now people will still be asking how many bodies were found at roswell well the other question would be what form will the ufo mystery take 100 years from now because ufos always seem to reflect the times well you can look at it two ways it depends on the strength of the et hypothesis if that is sort of continually endorsed and embraced on a massive scale nothing might change you know if sort of paradigm shift and people come round more to the idea of you know how things like dmt for example you know a definitively altered state the research of people like rick strassman has shown that this can sort of some people might say well it sort of creates an abduction story or like kind of like a communion with being some another realm you could argue just as well that it actually opens a portal or a doorway to another realm you don't see in a normal state of mind which is what i believe if that theory those kind of theories get endorsed more we might see the development of a phenomenon that you know goes down that path rather than the nuts and bolts alien angles it may change it may not it all depends i think on how the phenomenon is perceived well the other question would be then if there really is contact with alien beings We make the true first contact, the verifiable. Will that have anything to do with the UFO mystery? Wouldn't that be confusing? Imagine this now, that we are told that E.T. is really here. E.T. has arrived. Maybe they're the Vulcans, whatever. First contact, okay? And we see E.T., and we interact with them, and then we learn that the entire UFO mystery had nothing to do with that. This is their first visit here. Wouldn't that be strange? Well, yeah, but it would be also fascinating from the perspective of looking at how and why belief systems develop and how and why they can become so strong that people actually believe they're seeing something that isn't there. 
you know, or are they actually creating something in the mind with such power that it externally projects it, you know, like a tulpa, uh, like a thought form type situation. You know, so even if that scenario did happen, which is an intriguing one, there would still be major work to be done to try and determine how and why and, you know, under what circumstances, you know, sort of belief, etc., kind of developed, you know. You know, I have another crazy idea that just occurred to me. What if the UFO mystery as we perceive it consists of illusions generating the real ETs are doing it, they're generating these illusions to prepare us for their future presence? Well, I mean, that, that's entirely possible. But I mean, because like you point out, every generation that's talked about UFOs has done so from the perspective of seeing things that are relevant to their era. You know, 19th, 20th century, it was airships, where airships were being flown. In the 40s, it was flying discs, and the 50s, classic flying saucers, uh, and Space Brothers. Then you had the almost like a crossover point where you had like the Villas Boas and the Hills abduction, you know, where they were sort of cl halfway between human looking and the greys and then from the 70s onwards the greys then you had the praying mantis and the reptilians and the flying saucers went away and it's flying triangles the landings and the contact cases and occupant cases described you know by the lorenzans and apro all those sorts of people what happened to them aliens taking soil samples vehicle interference all this went away, but many of these cases kind of smack of staged events specifically designed for the witness to see. And I actually think that is what happened. You know, I don't think it's random chance that people kept running across aliens taking soil samples. They were meant to see them to reinforce a particular imagery. So I think, you know, there has been manipulation of the mindset to climatize us to the presence of something at least. So these events are staged for their benefit, not so much for ours. I have an interesting question from Ufology, by the way, that's his, his address and his member name over at our Paracast forums at forum.theparacast.com. And let me start with these questions. This is an interesting one that we can go into for a while. He says, you suggest that if ufology fails to seize the growing challenge it already faces, that it won't die or fade away, but will still be here and here, popping up now and again. To quote, not unlike a nasty, itchy rash picked up in the private room at the local strip joint on a Friday night that never quite goes away. My question is, it sounds like you might have had some personal experience in this regard, and I'm wondering <laughs> if you can tell us which clubs people should avoid or if just avoiding them on Fridays would be sufficient. Um, well, no, no, no personal uh, knowledge at all of anything like that. That was purely meant as a, as a joke, and um, everybody, uh, <laughs> I would hope, can understand it was meant as a joke. So let's assume this way that... We wonder if Nick Redfern goes out at night, is one of those nighttime people who has fun and frolic, or frolic and fun, depending on your point of view. What do you think? Well, yeah, I have a good social life, but I mean, I'm I'm not going to, you know, I want somebody, some woman to dance for me. I'm not going to pay money for it, you know, <laughs> and um, I'm certainly not going to risk getting some uh, nasty disease. So, uh, but I think the analogy is, you know, worth mentioning the fact that, you know, it's kind of ufology is just not going to go away regardless. And, you know, there are unsavory, unsavory and annoying aspects to it, just like a real nasty rash. So. <laughs> Well, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. You have to wonder about that. We're talking about an article that Nick Redfern wrote called The Future of Ufology for Mysterious Universe magazine. Now, our co-host, Chris O'Brien, is on assignment. He's preparing for that great big lecture in Northern California that's happening now, so it's too late to send you there. But, therefore, I asked Nick Redfern to serve a double duty today, not just one job, but two jobs, guest co-host and guest so there's a duality here. He has to become two people. He has to pretend to be schizophrenic. No, I'm joking. I'm Gene Steinberg. He's Nick Redfern. You're in... The Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. 
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many files formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code Night Owl. Use the coupon code Night Owl to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Every day, nearly 3,000 families enter into foreclosure and face losing their home. If you're currently behind on your mortgage, you can still avoid foreclosure. You can save your home, but you need to act now. We're Allied State Foreclosure Services. We're experts in saving homes from foreclosure. With just one phone call to us, you can stop the foreclosure process, lower your monthly mortgage payments, and save your home. Call now. The call is free with no obligation. 1-800-597-8843. Call us if you've been threatened with foreclosure, denied loan modification, or missed a payment on your mortgage. If you've been a victim of a predatory loan or are upside down on your mortgage, even if you've lost your job and you're worried about losing your home, don't wait. Call us now and let us help you save your home. You've worked hard to build a life with your family. Let us help you keep your home. Call now before it's too late. 1-800-597-8843. 1-800-597-8843. 1-800-597-8843. If you owe the IRS back taxes, listen carefully. Sweeping changes to IRS policies will help more people than ever eliminate their tax debts once and for all. And now I can help you reduce or eliminate your tax debts and end your tax nightmare. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. I've helped thousands of people reduce and eliminate tax debts they couldn't pay. And after more than 30 years of experience dealing with the IRS, I can tell you there's no such thing as a hopeless tax case. And with the IRS's new policies, it's easier than ever to put your tax debt behind you once and for all. Call now at 800-346-6829 to learn how I can help you. You know your IRS debt will not go away by itself, but you don't have to live in fear anymore. Call 800-346-6829. Learn how I can help you eliminate wage and bank levies, release tax liens, and negotiate a settlement with the IRS that will put your tax nightmare behind you forever. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to TaxHelpOnline.com. That's TaxHelpOnline.com. The worst drought in 50 years continues, and the first six months of 2012 marks the hottest half year on record. 78% of the Midwest Corn Belt is in drought conditions. Not only corn, but soy, alfalfa, fruits, vegetables, and wheat are all impacted, raising prices. The cost to feed livestock is forcing farmers and ranchers out of business, blowing up your food prices. The only strategy to counter this is to freeze your food cost at today's prices by getting your own supply of foods from eFoods Direct now. As the price of raw ingredients increases, eFoods will have to raise prices too. Now is the time to get your supply. I recently increased my supply from eFoods Direct because we have all known this was coming. You know about their delicious long-term storable foods. The fact is you can eat at any time to save money today. And because it stores for 25 years, you're locking in today's prices and avoiding the rising food cost. Don't wait. Call 800-409-5633 or go to eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex. Call 800-409-5633 or eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex. You can bet your life on eFoods Direct. This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast. He's Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. Chris O'Brien is on assignment, and we're exploring the multi-interests, the multiple interests of Nick Redfern. We start out with the possibilities of a UFO crash at Aztec that he's looked into extensively, the possibilities of a crash at Kingman, Arizona that Harry Drew was talking about last week, now we're talking about the future of ufology, an article he wrote from a serious universe, and we have some questions from the audience. One from SRL, who's been a member of the Paracast Forum since November of 2010. Viewed from the sociologist's perspective, do you feel at this juncture in time what is commonly known as ufology is no more than one belief system in which is attempting to dominate 
that in Western culture what is viewed as organized religion. In other words, you feel that mainstream ufology has thus become a religion in and of itself. What do you think? Well, I think it has, but from the perspective that it's definitively belief-driven in one particular scenario, the ETH. So in that sense, it has become like a religion because, you know, religion itself basically is, you know, belief in something, but all religions insist, you know, that it's this or it's that, and they have their sort of specifically delineated guidelines. And for the most part, that's what ufology does, you know. Ufology itself would not be, um, you know, a, a appropriate to classify as like a religion or to compare it if it wasn't for the fact that ufology as a movement is so dominated by the ETH. In other words, it's become less about, in the same way that religion should be about exploring the mysteries or the potential mysteries of life after death, ufology should be about exploring the mysteries of what the UFO phenomenon is, but it's become upholding the ETH in the same way that Christianity is upholding that tradition. Hinduism is about upholding that tradition. Upholding the faith in the belief of ET. Yeah, that's okay. exactly what it's become. And so in that sense, it is for intents and purposes, a religion. Yes. Now, you'll have to outline the background of this question from SRL. What do you suggest it would take for highly credentialed researchers who have been conducting their research underground to resurface? So I guess the first question I have to ask Nick is, what is he talking about? What highly credentialed researchers are working underground? I have no idea. I mean, I, I figured from when you just read the question to me that it was like a hypothetical question. But I mean, so I can, I mean, I don't know anything about anybody who is doing that, so I can only answer it hypothetically. I think the problem is that even though we know there's a genuine UFO phenomenon, it's become so tarred with ridicule and, you know, jokes, etc., that it's the kiss of death for anybody, or not anybody, but for a lot of people in the scientific community to get involved and embrace the subject. You know, probably the closest people get in the scientific community is things like the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, you know, and theorizing on life on other worlds. But very few people in the scientific community get involved, you know, in terms of actual, hey, I'm a full unbeliever in alien reductions, etc. And And I think all it w what it would take would be a massive shift in the credibility factor which could be borne out by um, a huge development that, you know, legitimized what we're doing in the eyes of everybody else, never mind just us. So I think it would take something like that. Otherwise, people just aren't going to come forward and, you know, risk their reputations, etc. But you don't think there are any numbers of real credentialed scientists who are doing this stuff on the QT? Um, you know, I've never had anybody come to me with, you know, endless streams of letters after the name and say, hey, you know, I think this is going on, but I can never say so. But, I mean, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there aren't hundreds of people in the academic, you know, communities or scientific communities who have a passionate interest in UFOs but would never admit to it. You know, that, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, we so had real scientists about... like Dr. J. Allen Hynek who did admit it. But, of course, he started out working for the U.S. Air Force as yeah, their Yeah, I mean, things, guy, people yeah. like um, Hynek and Stan Friedman, you know, they've had the prince, presence of mind and the strength of character to come forward and say, hey, you know, I'm a scientist, but I believe. But, unfortunately, the majority of them just don't do it. They're not going to get those lucrative contracts from the government. Okay, okay. what would you suggest that this field needs in order to interest young and bright minds? I, I don't actually, you know, I, I don't care if he does or not, to be honest. You know, it's, you know it, it doesn't bother me if you, you know, I, I think you followed you have a future. It doesn't bother me, though, if he doesn't. You know, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. But are you but, seeing, when you do your lectures and you travel around, do you see young yeah. people there or is everybody over 50? No, that, that's actually, you know, I get this a lot where you see articles and, you know, people say, oh, it's, you know, all old codgers in the audience. Well, it's not. You know, you, you find a lot of young people, you know, sort of teens and 20s at lectures. But what I don't think is happening as much is that as many of them are, are moving into, like, research and articles and books, etc., you know, and getting on the lecture circuit themselves, that's one of the big differences, I think. You know, it's like a lot of people in ufology today 
who've been in it for 40, 50 years, they got into it as kids. They did a lot of on-the-road research, travelling around, doing interviews with a local newspaper and getting known as a local UFO guy and getting stories coming to them, then doing a few articles, books, getting on the lecture circuit, travelling around. I see less of that, I think, in you know, sort of teenagers and 20s. So they'll go um, to the lecture, they're interested in what's going on, but that's the extent of their interest. They'll never take it that next step. Well, I mean, some do, but not, I think, on the scale in years past. But I don't think that's necessarily got anything to do with UFOs. Or so. I think a lot of that has just to do with changes in culture and society in the same way that, you know, somebody, I know, just say hypothetically collects stamps, you know, a stamp collector. You know, maybe 20 years ago, they would have gone to these stamp fairs, you know, where people buy and bid for stamps or whatever. Maybe today, though, they'd go on the Internet and bid for them at a website. You know, I think, you know, it's kind of like that, that sort of society and technology has changed the way we interact with each other. And and if people can get it off the Internet or watch a lecture, you know, on YouTube after it's uploaded... Saves a lot of time. They have to sit down and write letters yeah. and send them to the yeah. post office and that stuff. Okay. Exactly. Okay. What role would you consider mainstream media plays in the perpetuation of the ETH mythos? I'm not sure it does. I think, you know, that you, I mean, the, the media, from our perspective, the, you know, the UFO community, you know, there's no doubt that the subject gets greater coverage, massive coverage, you know, compared to what it did 20 years ago. And certainly the, the laughter angle has definitely decreased. And I think one of the reasons is because, you know, even with TV, you know, they recognize that there is evidence of government investigations and things like this and official files. So, you know, they, they treat it more seriously. But The smirks are not fair in abundance anymore. No, but what I would say is that the TV, you know, any TV show, for the most part, focuses either on the idea that it, it was E.T. or as a mundane explanation. You know, it's like most Roswell documentaries. They're either going to look at the idea, was it E.T. or was it a mogul balloon? You know, they're going to not look at esoteric angles or whatever. Um, so in that sense, the media is guilty of helping perpetuate the ETH, but not, I don't think, from any sort of sinister New World Order perspective, you know, that somebody's pulling the strings. It's just that it's a lot of, you know, a lot of TV today, ironically, although there's greater coverage, it's just dumbed down crap, you know, stuff like... Um, people running around the woods saying, what the hell was that, you know, with night scope equipment. That's what, we get an abundance of that. We get far more paranormal TV than in the past, but it's just, it's not ironically investigative work. So, you know, a lot of the TV stuff today saying it's all aliens or whatever, it's just lazy journalism, you know. It's not even journalism, it's entertainment. I'm thinking, of course, of chasing well, UFOs. Right. I think people like, for example, James Fox are really dedicated in what they're doing about UFO research, but when they get onto a show like that, they're caught in the Hollywood syndrome of reality shows and the reality show syndrome. They have to be like the movie Paranormal Activity or Blair Witch Project where you have the nighttime lost footage images. And they look terrible and they sound terrible and it becomes unwatchable. Now I'm on my soapbox. There you go. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I agree with everything you say, but all, you know... I'm, I'm going to let it stop say, there for our next segment. He agrees with everything I just said. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to cherish the moment. I'm Gene Steinberg. He's Nick Redfern. You're in... The Paracast, sorry. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. 
It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Let's keep preparedness simple. Do you need stuff for disasters? Of course you do. For over 15 years, DisasterStuff.com has, well, stuff for disasters. See? Easy to remember. DisasterStuff.com. Want free shipping on a new Berkey water filter? DisasterStuff.com is the official Berkey in-stock shipping center. Lots of folks want an EMP Faraday bag to protect sensitive electronics during a solar or nuclear event. Now for a limited time, all survival gear purchases over $75 include a free 8x8 inch EMP Faraday bag. Just enter promo code EMP bag when you check out at disasterstuff.com. We're also a country living grain mill authorized dealer. Plus, we offer freeze dried foods by Alpine Air and Wise Foods. We also carry emergency kits, survival seeds, and much more. Preparedness should be simple, and it is. Just remember disasterstuff.com. Freedom through self reliance and personal responsibility. What do you do when your propane runs out and you don't have a large amount of wood for cooking? That's when you need a Grover Rocket Stove from StockStorage.com. The Grover Rocket Stove starts easily with any combustible material like junk mail, small twigs, leaves, weeds, or dry sagebrush. Then just add a small amount of kindling wood and you'll be cooking entire meals in minutes. Grover Rocket Stoves are made right here in the USA and are built to last a lifetime using heavy-duty thick-gauge steel and are painted with high-temp paint to withstand heat. Go to StockStorage.com and see three great Grover Rocket Stoves, stainless steel, heavy duty, or our original Grover Rocket Stove for only $135 and get free shipping to the lower 48. For phone orders, call 801-361-6984 or go to StockStorage.com. That's 801-361-6984 or StockStorage.com. The original Grover Rocket Stove Minimal Wood Use Cooking Stoves, available exclusively from StockStorage.com. That's the sound of your door being kicked in by an intruder with a single kick. That's the sound of the same door now protected by the Door Sentinel at MySafeDoor.com. Go to MySafeDoor.com right now and watch the amazing video. At MySafeDoor.com, you'll learn how to turn your home into a fortress with the Door Sentinel. 16 kicks later, and the Door Sentinel is still holding strong. MySafeDoor.com. That's MySafeDoor.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Hi, this is Ted Phillips listening to the Paracast, and it's as good as it gets, believe me. Nick Redfern joins us as guest and guest co-host. Chris O'Brien's on assignment. I'm Gene Steinberg exploring the future of ufology. We have lots of questions, and let's go on. Questions from forum.theparacast.com. We have a place there called the Question Bank. And when we know we're going to have a guest on in the future, and sometimes we book them at the last minute, we can't do that. We know we have the guest. We open it up for you to ask your questions. So Midwinter, who has been with our forum since 2009, a really simple question, probably too simple. Wouldn't it benefit ufology to cease to exist and the study of all things unidentified and paranormal to be researched together? How much is the actual term ufology itself a barrier to the study of unidentified flying objects? How about that question? Well, that's that's such a very good question. It's probably one of the best I've been asked in a long time because, you know, when you look at ufology, just the term ufology itself is self-limiting because, you know, it, it suggests even subconsciously that we just investigate in objects in the sky that maybe land occasionally that are linked with abductions, et cetera. You know, but it's like, what do you do when somebody's seen 
a UFO at the same time and place as Bigfoot? What do you do when, you know, somebody invokes a UFO encounter by getting themselves into an altered state, you know, whether through DMT or LSD? You know, I've interviewed a lot of people who've had profound UFO experiences while on LSD, and, you know, I don't think they were just hallucinating. I think they opened... A, like a portal or we're able to perceive something that we don't perceive in a normal state you follow it's not the same thing state. as a person taking a couple of martinis and just imagining <laughs> something no i i think the term ufology is self-limiting because for so long it's it's implied nuts and bolts alien spacecraft and nothing else but it's when we take it if we could look outside that box and realize it's just a part of a bigger thing then it wouldn't be self-limiting. But, you know, if the UFO community won't do that and all it wants is... You know, Greg Bishop calls this UFO porno, which is a great term. You know, he, he, people just want the exciting tales over and over again of crashed UFOs at Area 51, etc., etc. It's never going to change, you know. It's going to require a massive sort of paradigm shift on what people view ufology as versus what they did view it as. One of those things that we hope will become better, but maybe not. All right, a lesser question from midwinter. Does Nick see differences between ufology in the U.S. and other countries such as the U.K.? Well, certainly in South America, I see a lot of differences when we have someone like A.J. Gavard from Brazil. I'm seeing maybe a more serious approach. Um, I don't think, you know, the subject's any more serious in Britain than it is to the U.S. I mean, they're the two I can sort of relate to the most, you know, because I live in the US, I've, you know, I've been here 12 years, but I'm originally from England. I guess that the biggest difference I, c I can definitely see is that the ETH is less relied upon in the UK. You know, people do sort of look more at the other ideas, but they're perceived as being skeptics because, you know, they look at things like plasmas. Even when, you know, even when people talk about plasmas that could have an effect on the human mind and provoke hallucination, they're still viewed as pla as debunkers or skeptics or whatever so that, that's one of the things i get quite a bit is that you know the angle of you know the difference of endorsing this theory or just you know being more open to other theories but i think beyond that there aren't that many differences you know there's there's lecture circuits conferences books theories ideas you know you see a lot of the same people at different lectures and conferences you know so it's a good social scene as well so other than other than the fact that you know the ETH isn't sort of all dominating as such, I, I don't think it's that much different, really. It's just the language, the language difference. But you tend to have, for example, I noticed in South America, it seemed the reports were more extreme, in the sense of oh, yeah, abductions and contacts. And yeah, I think you know a lot of the um, certainly the South American stuff. Um, you know, it is very different to what you see elsewhere. You know, they still get a lot of those sort of landing cases and. You know, where they're sort of, they're often more sort of threatening and um, disturbing to the witnesses. You know, in the US today, I mean, it's like how often as UFO researchers do we really get, you know, so sort of those definitive Zamora type cases, you know, the Lonnie Zamora landing, or, you know, things like that, or the Kelly Hopkins bill, you know, the goblins and the shootouts, or, you know, the flyovers of DC. We don't get those anymore, uh, but certain parts of the world do get strange cases. So I think a lot of it is cultural in some respects. Yeah, that is very interesting. Think about the kind of cases we had back in the 1950s. And someone suggested once that maybe those UFOs, those spacecraft, whatever, assuming they were spacecraft, have left us, and what we're seeing now is something totally different. Well, that's right. I mean, I think the big problem is there's always a tendency, you know, that if people see strange things in the sky, that it's all part of one great phenomenon there's, there's no reason why it should be i mean you know for, for ufos in general there's there's countless theories i mean obviously there's the eth then you've got you know the, the secret aircraft angle plasmas ball lightning you know trevor james constables you know these sort of living jellyfish in the sky that are mistaken as flying saucers and and even if they are genuine ufos you know you're quite right who's to say it's the same ones coming over and over again. You know, why shouldn't it be the case that one lot goes away and, and another one arrives? I mean... Maybe oh, they thought we were very boring. And they said, you know well, what, yeah. those earthlings, they just can't get their stuff together. Let's just go off to another star system. And then somebody else discovers us. Well, I mean, you could actually make 
quite some merit out of that because, you know, in the 50s, you had the sort of Space Brothers and the Flying Saucers. Even the Hills aliens, you know, weren't really the greys of today. And the Flying Saucers have gone, and today it's Flying Triangles. So, and this is all in the course of like 60 years. There's been massive change. So, you know, maybe there is an argument there to be made that it's not the same ones over and over, that it's something ever changing or just an endless list of different entities. That's why, you know, I kind of go more with a sort of portal window area angle rather than all these different races, if you like, you know, zooming back from this star system or that one, you know. I want to go into more window areas in a moment because we have a question about that. In fact, it's two questions hence, so let's just go to Gog Smacky. That's the guy's name, and he's a very prolific member of our forums. In the English-speaking world, we mostly hear of paranormal events in these countries. Do you think or know if paranormal events are happening evenly across the world? Is it just due to the reporting infrastructure or culture that leads us to not hearing much from some parts of the world? I think, you know, we do hear from other parts of the world. You know, there's no doubt about that. It's to what extent people bother to find out. You know, you mentioned A.J. Javad earlier. You know, A.J.'s always putting stories out. Um, You know, it's to what extent people type into Google, you know, South America plus UFO plus latest sighting or whatever. You know, if people aren't going to look for the information and just hope somebody's going to spoon feed them, well, you know, you're not going to find out what's going on in Russia or whatever. Um, Or you're going to find out what's, you know, going on at home, so to speak. So, you know, there's, there's no doubt that sightings and encounters and however you want to turn them are going on all the time. It's what, you know, it's to what extent they're sort of highlighted in someone else's country. You know, um, it's kind of like, um, I mean, a classic example, how many people in America right now might know what are the most popular programs on English TV in general? Probably not many, you know, and vice versa. Because the only English programs we know about, of course, are Doctor Who and a few shows <laughs> on BBC America. That's about it. Are you a fan of Doctor um, Who? No, I don't like science fiction at all. Oh, okay. I don't watch it. No. All right. Which is kind of an interesting thing, you know. That I'm in, I'm interested in UFOs and write about them, but you know, space fights and laser guns and silver suits. I like horror, but I, science fiction doesn't really do anything for me, you know. And uh, and sort of lofty highbrow in sci-fi does even less for me. Well, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if it is actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to understand your very personality, what you're interested in. Let's get into this subject, which we mentioned briefly, and we'll take it to the next segment. What is your opinion of the possible existence of portal areas? Mm. And you oh, alluded right. to that very briefly. I want more detail in this segment. We only have like 30, 40 seconds left, then we'll move to the next one. Well, I mean, in that sort of period time, uh, you know, I'd say that I, I actually do think that answers a lot of the questions. I think the more we dig into it and the way these cases are so fragmentary and these things are here and gone, I actually think the portal window area that Kale used to speak about is more valid than the you know the nuts and bolts craft coming from this star system or that one. It's certainly a faster way of getting here, I'll tell you that. Okay, yeah. folks, let me just tell you that Chris O'Brien is on assignment. He'll be back next week with more exciting stuff to report, especially about that UFO convention he's attending. He's Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in... Paracast, without the ha-ha. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. 
We the people grow cotton, we fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit, then carting to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. What's safer and cheaper than prescription drugs? Glad you asked. The answer is Renovation Teas. Herbal remedies are much safer and much cheaper than prescription drugs. Taste great, and most importantly, herbal teas are effective and non-addictive. Renovation Tea is especially unique, and here's why. We spent years researching herbs and their beneficial properties. Renovation Teas uses only 100% organic, fair trade herbs. Our teas are blended towards specific ailments and health conditions, such as diabetes, blood pressure, anxiety, libido, detox, and much more. All Renovation Teas are formulated and hand-filled in Arkansas. Take care of yourself naturally, the way Mother Nature intended. Order Renovation Teas at RenovationTea.com or call 870-784-3121. That's 870-784-3121. Renovation Tees. Renovate your health one bag at a time. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Uh Aha, and a couple of ho-hos on the Paracast. Nick Redfern joining us as guest and guest co-host playing the dual role. He's become schizophrenic. There are two of him right now. I'm seeing one Nick over there, one Nick over there. But this show is actually in mono. That's five martinis. That's actually six or eight. But seriously speaking, (laughs) all seriousness aside, folks, we've been talking about the future of ufology and answering your questions at forum.theparacast.com. Gog Smacky had asked several questions, actually three questions or four questions, depending on how you combine them. And the mid-question was, what is your opinion of the possible existence of portal areas? But we have a very wide-ranging audience here, Nick. And some of our listeners know what I'm talking about, what you're talking about, when we talk of window areas, portal areas. For those who need a 101 or an FAQ about portal areas, what are they? Well, basically, I mean, over the years or decades, they've had various titles. Like John Keel talked about window areas. Other people talked about portals, gateways to other realms of existence, um, interdimensional gateways or doorways. Now, you know, all those terms are, of course, theoretical. But, you know, things like quantum physics today are allowing for the existence of other dimensions. I guess the best way to describe it is, you know, you're in your car, driving down the road, and you turn the radio on. And for me, if I turn the radio on and there's classical music playing, I'm like, oh, God, quickly change the channel. And then if it's disco, I change it again until there's something heavy, pounding and guitar based. And then I leave it on. So in other words, all these channels are playing at the same time, but you can only be tuned into one at any given moment. And unless you understand the technology of radio, you can only ever be on one. You know, if you don't know that turning this particular dial changes the channel, you're always stuck on the one channel. And it's kind of like that, the idea that there are coexisting realms alongside us. And one of the reasons why I think these, this scenario is valid is because there are certain areas of the world, which we might term sort of hotspots, where they seem to be overloaded with just weird activity. And maybe these window areas aren't always static in one area, that they come and go, which might explain, for example, in the 1960s when... You had the Mothman encounters at Point Pleasant, West Virginia. You know, it was like the town was suddenly hit for a couple of years with Mothman sightings, contact tea cases, alien encounters, the men in black, poltergeist activity, occult activity, um, the bridge falling into the river and all the people dying, you know, which some people viewed as an omen. And then it came to an end. Okay, but that implies a lot of stuff in your one-paragraph answer. So I'm going to ask about that. The men in black... Is that a manifestation of creatures from elsewhere or just the government or hoaxers or all of the above? I would say all of the above. I mean, I wrote a book in 2011, The Real Men in Black, right. which, you know, looks at this whole mystery. And I, like the UFO subject, I don't think it can be categorized as one thing or another. 
Yes, there have been cases of hoaxing. Yes, there have been cases of mistaken identity. There are reports, obviously, from the 50s when people like the FBI dressed like the men in black, you know, black suits, black tie and fedora hat. And they typically turn up in a 50s-style black car. So some cases can be explained as the government, but there are weird, very weird men in black cases, and most of these were the ones that sort of focused on Point Pleasant, where you have these sort of skinny, pale-faced little guys who have sort of no understanding of our culture that actually come across as more less secret agents and more like pale-faced paranormal ghouls or something like that. And I, I use those terms literally. And I think the real men in black are a manifestation of something paranormal that's always been with us. And the men in black are sort of their latest incarnation and that, you know, getting involved in it is, can be sort of a dicey, you know, sort of area not to mess around with, you know, sort of people like Albert Bender, look at the trouble he got into, you know, so much. Yes, so but is it even happened. true that Albert Bender was anything more than just somebody a little screwy who invented a cover story uh, when his interests changed? Well, you know, I actually don't think so. When you look into it, you know, he, he exhibited a lot of the aspects that people talk about when they sort of get involved in these type of phenomena too deeply and it, then the phenomena gets its grips into them. You know, he began to suffer psychological health problems, physical health problems, bad luck, just overwhelming negativity in his life. You, you know, just strange things like this that you can go throughout history, you know, demonic possession and there's so many parallels with what he had that I, th I really do believe there's sort of like an occult world and if you open the door to it, it's not necessarily a good thing to do. And I think possibly, you know, these phenomena manifest in the way that our subconscious fears or desires even want them to. You know, that there's some evidence to suggest that Bender may well have got a visit from government people and warning him, warned him about his UFO group. This was around about the time of the Robertson panel, so that would make sense. But then what I think happened was that he got so panicked by this imagery of the black-suited government people visited him that the paranormal aspect got its grips into him by amplifying that imagery even more. And, you know, this sort of the paranormal Manny Black then strode into his life. Well, you imply in that that the paranormal can be very negative. Oh, yeah, I don't dispute that at all. I think, you know, I, you know, people think it's sort of cool and exciting to get involved in invoking this or that or Ouija boards and whatever. You know, I, I do really believe there's a genuine realm of the occult and that it's possible to invoke contact with it or open portals and doorways but depending on your mindset and the trickster like angle of this phenomenon which can be benevolent malevolent friendly malicious teaching deceptive whatever you want to term it you often get what sort of reflects your own character or you know if you're a weak person you get taken on by you know something that's of a very strong character because it can manipulate you and push you down all sorts of avenues, you know. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, I'm, I'm into all this sort of stuff. You know, I, I view the UFO phenomenon from a very esoteric, paranormal angle, not, you know, the nuts and bolts ufology angle, but I still believe the government's hiding its knowledge of something, but I think there are people in government who know it's not just nuts and bolts aliens. They know it, it interacts or embraces all this other weird stuff as well. Well, I have to say, I haven't gone into much detail, and I won't, but I think maybe you have a sense of it that my life has taken on a number of very strangely negative aspects in recent years. So I don't know whether that has anything to do with the phenomenon or just the well, luck of the I, draw. Well, I mean, what, you have to keep it balanced because, you know, one of the things that kind of annoys me about ufologists sometimes is that if anything happens in someone's life and they're a ufologist, it was because of, of ufology. I was just thinking there's a thread in our forums which says just because we're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't watching us. So maybe some things weird are happening, but then bad luck happens to everybody. People well, have like, reverses you know, in their lives, and you yeah. do not have to assume it's being caused by some external negative force. But I want to ask you one more thing before we go on from portal areas, and we'll be getting into something else which is related in a moment, and that is the crash of the Silver Bridge. It's just yeah. a crash, right? Well, you know, it depends how you look at it. I mean, different people have looked at it from a different perspective. You know, sometimes a bridge falls into the water just because it fell into the water because, you know, the struts have decayed over the years or whatever. Other people point out that of all places it could have collapsed was when, was in Point Pleasant, you know, when 
Mothman sightings, etc., at their height. And, of course, you can go throughout any aspect of culture and history throughout the world and find that bridges have always been associated with paranormal phenomena. You know, that's a fact. You know, you can take UFOs out of the equation and every country, you know, has the legend of the, you know, the, the ghostly lady of the bridge or the troll of the bridge, you know, or the Bigfoot of the bridge, that kind of thing. So bridges have played a long-standing role in, you know, paranormal activity. So, it's, you know, I, in this angle, you know, I truthfully don't know what the answer is. You know, I actually don't rule out the idea that, in this case, a bridge is just a bridge. Sometimes it is. In the same way, you know, that a ufologist dies young. Well, you can find, unfortunately, you can find any aspect of human society where somebody who isn't expected to die young dies young, or where somebody in ufology commits suicide, ah, it was really murdered by the government. But again, any cross-cultural look at society, somebody who never expected to commit suicide suddenly does, you know, and, and the people say, oh, he, was, he always seemed a very happy guy, you know. I'm never persuaded by that sort of stuff. So we assume here that life can have its reverses, but there's no reason whatever to assume it's related to phenomena well, or a single no. phenomenon that got to the break. Chris O'Brien is on assignment. I'm Gene Steinberg. He's Nick Redfern. You're in... The Paracast. Ha, ha, ho, ho, ha, ha. Hey, neighbors, you've seen all those crazy, wacky products on TV. The perfect tortilla, easy covers, hot booties, furniture fix, petty spin, and more... Where do you find all that stuff? You go to AsSeenOnTV.com because this is the one-stop source for all of these TV goods advertised. Find all your favorites as seen on TV. Check them out as SeenOnTV.com. And by the way, save 10%. Here's what you do. Use the code SEEN1, S-E-E-N number 1, SEEN1. Go to AsSeenOnTV.com to order. Save 10%. Purchase this summer's hottest as seen on TV items. Save 10%. Or call 1 866 2773 The code SCENE1 to save 10%. Hi, Jason Lewis here. Anybody who's been listening to my program knows how shaky the U.S. economy is right now. Will we have a V-shaped recovery or will it be a W-shaped one where the nation slips back into recession? Of course, if you think that Washington can spend or inflate its way out of a downturn, you've got nothing to worry about. But as you know, I have my doubts. So let me tell you about gold. Now, as my friend Ted Anderson from Midas Resources likes to say, gold, like all commodity markets, fluctuates in price, and you could lose money. But it has never been worth zero. Give it some thought, and if you're interested in converting your IRA to gold or would like to actually have it in your possession, call Midas Resources today at 1-800-686-2237. The U.S. dollar was once backed by gold, but has since lost 90% of its value. And if things don't change, I'm afraid the trend will continue. Call Midas Resources today at 1-800-686-2237 for gold and tell them Jason Lewis sent you. What's safer and cheaper than prescription drugs? Glad you asked. The answer is renovation teas. Herbal remedies are much safer and much cheaper than prescription drugs. Taste great, and most importantly, herbal teas are effective and non-addictive. Renovation Tea is especially unique, and here's why. We spent years researching herbs and their beneficial properties. Renovation Teas uses only 100% organic, fair trade herbs. Our teas are blended towards specific ailments and health conditions, such as diabetes, blood pressure, anxiety, libido, detox, and much more. All renovation teas are formulated and hand-filled in Arkansas. Take care of yourself naturally, the way Mother Nature intended. Order renovation teas at renovationtea.com or call 870-784-3121. That's 870-784-3121. Renovation teas. Renovate your health one bag at a time. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. That bears repeating. 
Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. And Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse is the key to digestive health. Pro-EM-1 is a powerful liquid probiotic, strong enough to cleanse, gentle enough to use every day. Pro-EM-1 is dairy, wheat, and soy-free, contains all natural and certified organic ingredients, contains no preservatives or animal products, supports a healthy digestive and immune system, supports weight loss, improves absorption of food nutrients, aids in controlling yeast infections, is never freeze-dried, and uses three groups of live, viable, beneficial microbes to cleanse and remove toxins. Order Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse at Terraganics.com, spelled T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com, Terraganics.com, or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Pro-EM-1, the raw probiotic. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Nick Redfern joining us. I'm Gene Steinberg. He is both guest and guest co-host this week. Chris O'Brien's on assignment. He'll tell us more next week. We were exploring the portal areas and about people getting caught up in paranormal or ufo related events we were answering the questions from gog smacky at our forums at forum.theparacast.com here's one more question from him do you think the ufo phenomenon is just one single as yet unidentified phenomena or are there multiple sources et military trickster etc places like skinwalker ranch caused me to question everything i ever thought i knew about ufos it really muddies the water in terms of clarity for me. What do you think? Well, yeah, no, I agree. I, but it shouldn't muddy the waters. And I'll tell you for why. Because we should realize that the phenomenon really isn't one thing. You know, that the, the, the question is actually correct. That when you look at it, there are some reports that do suggest solid nuts and bolts craft, which could have been E.T., I have my suspicions that at least some of the black triangles are military aircraft. Don't say all of them, but some of them are. You know, do I think that ball lightning in some cases has been responsible for a few UFO incidents? Yeah, I'm certain it has. In the same way as, you know, sort of plasmas that the British Ministry of Defence addressed in their Condine report that was re, uh, released a few years ago. You know, a lot of people thought, that's just a cover story. But if you read that, it talks about how these plasmas can affect the human mind and make people see, you know, vision, have visionary experiences and things like that. So it's, it's a pretty in-depth report. So you have that angle, you know, you have things like Mactoni's crypto-terrestrial idea, you know, that of um, ancient humanoids living alongside us, trying to pass themselves off as extraterrestrial to mask their real identity. You have the time travel theory, you know, the idea that it's us from the future coming back to try and save the species thousands of years from now, you have the interdimensional, the portal angle. Now, I'm not saying, of course, all these are correct, but what I am saying is that there's no reason why we shouldn't take the view that multiple things should be going on. Why should it just be ET or it's all just model UFOs hanging on a piece of wire? You know, there's, there's no reason why multiple theories can't be correct. So in the answer, therefore, what are UFOs all of the above? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, what about Skinwalker Ranch? Now, we did a special roundtable on Skinwalker Ranch just a couple of weeks ago, one of our best-received shows. So what's your take on all the crazy stuff that's going on there? Well, I kind of view that like I view Point Pleasant or I view a place near in England, near, very near where I grew up, called the Cannet Chase, a large area of forest, which, like the Skinwalker Ranch, you know, was the site, or still is the site of strange creatures, UFOs, ghostly activity, paranormal goings-on. And, you know, that's how I view the Skinwalker Ranch, um, is that it's kind of like one of these window area type places where it's like somebody or something said, OK, it's going to be you for the next two years or whatever, you know, and something opens and, and something comes through. You know, I don't pretend to understand the, the science and the, you know, behind it all, but I think there's enough of a trend and a pattern to see that that is what's going on, that, you know, certain areas seem to, of our planet, cross paths with, with somewhere else, whatever that somewhere might be. And it's not 
like a permanent thing always. It's like a, you know, a temporary situation. And I think for a, a specific period of time, it was Point Pleasant to turn and the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. It was that place's time for a while as well. We don't hear about the Bermuda Triangle much anymore. You know, that was well, a big no. rage. I know back in the 70s, Charles Burles had a best-selling book, The Bermuda Triangle, which then led him into doing a book about the Philadelphia Experiment. Bermuda Triangle, what about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons we don't hear so much about it is because as time passes and some of these mysteries, people lose interest in them, less people are investigating them. I think that's what it comes down to a lot of the time. You know, if we take, for example... Um, you know, like crop circles. If you look at the, the crop circle field today, it's more about recording the cases, getting good photographs, and the media covering them in the local British newspapers. 20 years ago, it was more about researching, you know, the, the nodes and the lay of the land and, you know, is there elevated microwave, microwave regions in the area, that kind of thing. So even that's changed. And I, and I think it comes down to trends and trends attract people in varying degrees at varying times. And, um, and I think that's the same with the Bermuda Triangle. Maybe it's not that there aren't cases going on, but if there's nobody really actively researching them to a great degree and writing about them, it goes away. It's like even abductions. I mean, you look at the late 80s, you know, Whitley Strieber, uh, or the 80s in general, the, you know, the Andreasen books. You know, there was a, a massive influx of abduction books and stories. Even that's dropped off to that today. Doesn't mean the reports aren't going on as much, but you know, if, if there's not that visibly a scene, it kind of fades away. And I think that's probably what's happened with the Bermuda Triangle. Or maybe the events don't happen if people aren't around to write about them. Well, that's right. Sometimes, you know, somebody goes through the Bermuda Triangle and has a bit of engine trouble, and they perceive it as being because of the Bermuda Triangle. Because people have written about that. Well, maybe, you know, engine trouble's just sometimes engine trouble. Turbulence in the sky is sometimes just turbulence in the sky. But you associate it with something weird because we all know the air is supposed to be weird. So. And the same thing is true about other areas around the country and around the world. Yeah. Well, I will never go through the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> because I think I they'll get me. They'll get me, I'll tell you right now. I'm positive they'll well, get me there looking for me. But then Jim Mosley lives in Key West. He's not that far from the Bermuda yeah, I mean, Triangle. I'm sure I went through it when I went to Puerto Rico on various occasions looking for the Chupacabra. You know, I flew off from Florida. I'm sure I went through it a bit. I don't remember any turbulence or missing time or anything, you know. So. But that doesn't mean anything, you know. How do you know you didn't? Maybe you forgot about what really happened. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, I'll look about that. Possibly. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, we'd hope with Skinwalker Ranch that a certain person by the name of Bob Bigelow would be more forthcoming about information. What's your take on him? Do you think he works for the government? Are they feeding him cash to do his stuff? Is he under contract um, with the government? I don't know much about the guy. I don't see any reason why. I mean, you know, why should people be saying that about him any more than anyone else? I, you know, I think he's just a guy who's who's got an interest in weird phenomena, you know. And he has enough money, he can do whatever he wants. He can be the eccentric millionaire. He could be doing it for his own purposes. He doesn't necessarily have to be working for the NSA. Although we had a guy named Chip on the show a couple of weeks ago. I would call him a Skinwalker Ranch insider. He works security, and he claimed that in Las Vegas, which I guess is an office for the people who work for Bigelow, he did see NSA-related materials there. So I don't know. Well, That's the story. Well, I guess it depends how you define NSA-related materials. I mean, I've got a stash of NSA-related materials. It's like hundreds of pages of UFO files through the Freedom of Information Act. Some of them have NSA crests on them, and they're only first generation, so they look... You and know, you're not good working for the NSA. We're almost assured of that. <laughs> no, I'm not working for the NSA, but, you know... There you go, who... there you go. i got to do the break. All right. Chris O'Brien's on assignment. He's Nick Redfern. I'm Gene Steinberg. Imagine that. And that means you're in... The Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. 
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Fight back this cold and flu season with the world's best garlic extract, Ali C. Why Ali C? Because it helps your body fight viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Ali C has been scientifically proven in double blind studies using low doses to greatly reduce the number, severity, and duration of common colds. Ali C contains 300 milligrams of stabilized allicin, the active ingredient in crushed garlic. Studies show Ali C is effective against MRSA, bacterial, fungal, and viral infections. One tablet of Ali C has the equivalent of 40 cloves of garlic. Ali C supports your body's resistance to all types of conditions and can help lower high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So boost your body's resistance to infection with nature's best garlic extract, Ali C. For more information and to order Ali C, call 877-888-7126 or go to garlichealthproducts.com. That's 1-877-888-7126 or go to garlichealthproducts.com for your Ali C today. Do you owe the IRS money that you can't pay? Are tax liens and levies ruining your life? Are you tired of being afraid just to go to the mailbox? If this describes you, then Dan Pilla can help. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla, and I've been solving tax problems for more than 30 years. In fact, I wrote the book that made it possible to negotiate settlements with the IRS, and I've helped thousands of people do exactly that. Call now at 800-346-6829 to learn how I can help you. You know your IRS debt will not go away by itself, but you don't have to live in fear anymore. New changes to IRS policies will help more people than ever before eliminate their debts once and for all. There's no need for you to suffer another day with IRS debt. Call 800-346-6829. I can help you eliminate wage and bank levies, release tax liens, and negotiate a settlement with the IRS that will put your tax nightmare behind you forever. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, TaxHelpOnline.com. That's TaxHelpOnline.com. America, land of the free. But how free can you be, really, when Internet viruses and malware can attack your computer? Sure, you have antivirus protection, but it's not free, is it? Until now. Now, Zone Alarm offers free antivirus protection. And independent studies show that Zone Alarm provides better malware protection than even Norton and McAfee. And they're not free, are they? Declare your freedom and go to GetBetterForFree.com. That's GetBetterForFree.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. He's Nick Redfern, I'm Gene Steinberg, Chris O'Brien's on assignment, and we're exploring an article that Nick did for Mysterious Universe called The Future of Ufology, and we're going to cover more of that right now. Conrad Hartman who is a relatively new member of our forums at forum.thepowercast.com, says, In the future of ufology, you said, can you imagine if the major UFO conference of the year in the United States had a group of speakers where the presentations were on alien abductions and DMT, the Aleister Crowley lamb controversy, ufological synchronicities, and the UFO occult connection? And his question would be, 
in response to that comment. Do you think such a conference might be feasible on a small scale? And what speakers would you include in the lineup? Maybe this is an idea in the offering here. What do you think? Well, I mean, yeah, a, a conference along those lines isn't just feasible. I mean, it's 100% doable. The big task, I suppose, is to convince the big groups to actually put that on because, you know, most of us certainly, you know, me included, you know, we don't have the money to sort of hire a, a big room and, you know, fly in speakers from across the, you know, the country or whatever. It'd be great if we could, you know, they just, it, you know, it's, it's just not going to happen. But so you need somebody who's got the budget to be able to do that first. But in terms of the speakers and the subject matter, that's not a problem. I mean, I mean, what I would say in terms of the whole DMT angle of potentially DMT, you know, opening doorways to other realms, possibly. I mean, I would say Rick Strassman, because he wrote, you know, The Spirit Molecule, which is about the effects of DMT and, you know, what seems to be interaction with some other entities, if you like, but via an altered state. The whole thing with um, Crowley and Lamb, I would say uh, Adam Go Rightly, who's very learned on that subject. You know, if you wanted somebody else, you know, talking about, uh, sort of other esoteric angles, I'd say Greg Bishop, you know, Greg's um, written extensively, you know, on the idea of the, the phenomenon not being extraterrestrial. So, you know, th that's just three off the top of my head, you know, there's there's no reason this can't be done. I think the problem is many of the big UFO groups perceive, and, and I have to admit they perceive it correctly, that what brings the punters in to the conferences is conspiracies about aliens and alien abductions, and the idea that crop circles are the work of aliens, and that it's all alien, basically. That brings people in. You know, this may sound cynical, but I don't think major conferences would be totally against, some of them would, because they're stuck in the old ways, but some of them wouldn't be adverse against putting on that conference on those very topics, but they would be worried that it wouldn't bring in enough people, and they'd, you know, lose money, so they don't gamble it. They just go with, let's have somebody talking about the alien angle of Roswell, crashed UFOs at Area 51, alien abductions, etc., etc., and, and play it safe. Again, it's, as they say, politically correct. That's the whole part exactly of it here. It has incorrect. to be commercially viable. I think that's part of it right there. Would such a conference be commercially viable? Well, well, that's the thing. It might not be, but the reason it might not be is because... You know, the audience that's interested in UFOs has been indoctrinated to a significant degree in the ETH. It's not, you know, when the, when the whole subject is dominated by the ET angle, inevitably people are drawn to it and read to it and read on it. They're going to be exposed mostly to the ETH. So you're going to have more, obviously more people amenable to that theory. And so, you know, it's it sort of, it goes in like a cycle. So, yeah, I think there actually is something to be said that even among, amongst the audiences or the potential audiences, you are going to have less who are going to come along to that conference purely and simply because less people are exposed to that angle. Well, it would be a cool idea if we can get somebody to fund it. I think it'd be well, yeah, it would be I would even go would there. I'll tell you, I don't go to too many UFO events anymore. I used to. But I would go to this one if somebody was willing to put up the money. And the reason I say that is because back in the 1970s, I tried to sponsor a UFO convention myself and my first wife, Geneva, and a gentleman by the name of Fred G. Phillips, who was once my business partner. And we all got together and we put on this UFO convention in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. And I wish we had maybe another 1000 or $2,000 to promote it. I think we could have brought in a really good audience Instead, we lost about $100, which in 1970s dollars, it seemed like a lot to us. So I vowed I would never, ever, did I say never, ever, do it again. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it is one of these situations where putting on a conference isn't just as easy as putting on a conference, you know. You have the logistics of booking the place, getting the people in, you know. I mean, I see a lot of this behind the scenes where, you know, people are putting conferences on, you know, because when I'm speaking at conferences, you do see a lot of what goes on. And one thing I see more than anything else is frazzled conference organizers, you know, running around like headless chickens, worrying if they're going to get everybody in, if the flights are coming on time, are they going to get enough people, enough walk-ins on, on the day itself? You know, and it's like, 
I just don't want the hassle, you know. I just can't be bothered with the hassle of it all. I'll go to conferences and speak, and I'm always pleased and happy to hang out and chat with people, but, you know, don't ever ask me to put a conference on because it's like I couldn't think of anything worse. I was looking here at the schedule for UFOCon, and that's in Santa Clara, California, in the Silicon Valley, you know, where they have Apple and Google mm -hmm. and all those people. Mm -hmm. And in order to bring a crowd, they have a pretty wide range of speakers. Of course, we have our own Chris O'Brien there, and we have a lot of really serious people there. We have Rich Dolan, but we also have a few people who are, shall we say, more of the extreme nature in terms of UFOs. And you have to think that it's done because the sponsors want to bring in a crowd. They want to bring in an audience, so they bring in not just the serious UFO researchers who are willing to share the stage, but the people who maybe have wackier ideas. Well, I mean, if you're a conference organizer, there's nothing wrong, you know, with wanting to fill your auditorium. You know, that's something what every conference organizer sh should strive to do. But in saying that, it shouldn't be decided, you know, you shouldn't make your speaker roster based on who you think will fill the auditorium. What you should do is want to fill it, but have a wide range of speakers and hope, you know, you can get the word out as to why it's important to come you know, not just because it's the same old faces, you know. Um, so by all means, yeah, try and fill your auditorium, but don't do it from a cynical ploy of booking this person or that person. Yes, I think that ends up being a negative. And I think I couldn't get involved in that kind of UFO-style event. Maybe it would be too politically incorrect. I well, don't know. For me, I don't know not, if I it's do. Not even politically, I don't even consider it for the politically incorrect angle. It's just I don't want the stress and the hassle of doing it. You know, it, it's you can take UFOs out of the equation. I wouldn't organise a conference on, I don't know, how to look after your pet dog. You know, it's just I wouldn't do point. it. No, I I did it once, and I used to help Jim Mosley back in the 1960s. Jim staged UFO conferences in New York City. You know, monthly he'd have an event with a guest speaker, and then every so often he'd do a really full-fledged UFO convention. And I don't know if he ever really enjoyed it because you're so wrapped up in the nuts and bolts mm -hmm. of, as you say, booking the guests and making yeah. sure everybody's happy and dealing with the hotels and the hassles and all that stuff, and then trying hoping to recover your expenses. Whether or not you make money, who knows? I even wonder these days if those convention organizers who have these events, and they've got all these speakers flown in from around the country. You know, you get all these plane tickets, and we know the airlines are getting rich over them. Certainly, if you look at the places where people came to attend this UFO con in Santa Clara, California, people from around the country, you think of the airlines getting rich over those tickets, you think of the hotels being flush with guests, but you have to think, do they really get enough money to make it all worthwhile? Is it worth well, the time, the know, trouble, I and the think, energy? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the times, you know, it, they may break even. That's why I always tell people, you know, it's like you followed, you've got to earn a living from it. He's a, he's a hazardous job. You know, I couldn't. I work full-time as a writer, but, you know, in terms of... Um, you know, the ufology as... Only a very the, few people, the, only yeah. a very few people make the big bucks. He's Nick Redfern. <laughs> he doesn't make the big bucks from UFOs. I'm Gene Steinberg. I don't either. You're in... The Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first-class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one-click web apps such as WordPress, 24-7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to DreamHost.com slash radio, DreamHost.com slash radio. Web whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. Here it 
is another election year. And here you are again wishing you knew more about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the other amendments, and the Declaration of Independence. But who has the time to study? Wouldn't it be nice if you could simply listen to them? And wouldn't it be great if they came packaged with an index? Yep, an index that lets you go to any part of the founding documents just by punching in a track number on your computer or CD player. What exactly is the Ninth Amendment? Track 10, play. It's that simple. The Founding Documents Collection on Audio CD. To get yours now, just go to Amazon.com and type in Founding Documents Collection CD. For just $19.95 and $3.99 shipping and handling, you'll have the firepower you need to argue from the ultimate facts that form our nation's foundation. Want to be a hero? Get one for you and give another to your local school for Constitution Day. Go to Amazon.com now and type in Founding Documents Collection CD. American gardeners and fellow patriots make the right choice with your money, time, and your family food supply. Choose 100% pure heirloom seeds in the Survival Seed Vault from MyPatriotSupply.com. Why spend more? The Survival Seed Vault from MyPatriotSupply.com is only $37.95 and includes 20 varieties of pure, hardy, easy-to-grow heirloom seeds. Yes, only $37.95. That's 70% less than our competitors. You could buy three Survival Seed Vaults for less than one of theirs. The Survival Seed Vault from MyPatriotSupply.com includes detailed planting and seed saving instructions and ships same day plus all orders over $49 ship free mypatriotsupply.com is american owned by patriots like you passionate about freedom and preparedness call now 866-229-0927 that's 866-229-0927 or discover more emergency preparedness items when you order at mypatriotsupply.com choose the original choose the survival seed vault at mypatriotsupply.com Every day, nearly 3,000 families enter into foreclosure and face losing their home. If you're currently behind on your mortgage, you can still avoid foreclosure. You can save your home, but you need to act now. We're Allied State Foreclosure Services. We're experts in saving homes from foreclosure. With just one phone call to us, you can stop the foreclosure process, lower your monthly mortgage payments, and save your home. Call now. The call is free with no obligation. 1-800-597-8843. Call us if you've been threatened with foreclosure, denied loan modification, or missed a payment on your mortgage. If you've been a victim of a predatory loan or are upside down on your mortgage, even if you've lost your job and you're worried about losing your home, don't wait. Call us now and let us help you save your home. You've worked hard to build a life with your family. Let us help you keep your home. Call now before it's too late. 1-800-597-8843. 1-800-597-8843. 1-800-597-8843. This is Jacques Vallée. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Gene Steinberg and Nick Redfern are starving writers now. We're no, getting no, by. I mean, joking aside, it is one of these things, you know, where it's like any, you know, any self-employed job, you know, you you got to go where the work is. Um you know, you don't starve, but I mean, you gotta, you've got to go where the work is. It's no good just saying, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to do this, come out all high water." You know, it's if if you're a self-employed person, you you know, whatever you are, you know, if you're a gardener, if you, I don't know, house painter, you know, you 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 go with the work that's offered, you know, or that's available. You don't just say, "Oh, I'm just going to do nice old-style houses." You know, <laughs> that's ridiculous. You'll run out of old-style houses. Exactly. Okay, back to UFOs. Back to the question from Conrad Hartman. Yeah, second question. And it's about the article that Nick did called The Future of Ufology. What elements of the occult do you find most interesting in relation to the UFO phenomena? Um, I I would say the stuff like Crowley and Jack Parsons, you know, the idea of sort of invocations and altered states to manifest these entities that sound surprisingly UFO-like and the fact that many of these people are tied with ufology. You know, um, I mean, Jack Parsons, you know, actually talked about opening portals to let the flying saucers through. 
Alistair Crowley's lamb, if you look at the, the, the drawing that Crowley himself made, you know, it would be quite at home on the cover of a book about abductions. You know, it would. He's got like this large, hairless head and these little tiny shoulders and these penetrating eyes. Granted, they're not the big black eyes, but they're penetrating hypnotic eyes. Um, so it's things like that. The idea, you know, the altered states, psychedelics, um, the potential for opening doorways and portals to let something through that we don't normally see in, you know, sort of regular space time, if you like. Uh, those are the sort of aspects of the occult that interest me in relation to UFOs. To be honest, things like ghosts bore me stupid. You know, I've never written a book on ghosts and I never will because I'm just not interested, you know. Um, I don't know why, it just never sort of grabbed me. You know, cryptozoology and UFOs are my sort of two bigger areas, and some conspiracies or, you know, political conspiracies kind of bore me, uh, but some conspiracies. Um, but, you know, ghosts, no. But in terms of UFOs and the paranormal, as I said, the Crowley, Parsons type of stuff. In your conclusion to the future of ufology, in big, bold, not so bold letters, but all caps, you say... Ufology has failed. Why? Well, because we haven't solved the mystery. And, you know, I'm not saying by now we should have done, but all we've really achieved is we've collected a lot of sighting reports, a lot of witness testimony, and that's it. We have not got any answers. We've developed what we've got all these reports, all this testimony, and what we've done is not got an answer. What we've done is we've developed belief systems or more properly, one belief system. Um, and so if ufology is to achieve anything, it needs to think more outside the box. But then again, you know, there's no paranormal phenomenon on the face of this planet, no matter how old it is, that we've solved to everybody's satisfaction. It's always stayed enigmatic and one step ahead of us or one step away from us. You so know, are we is. never meant to solve the UFO mystery? Is it one of those well, things, as Ray Palmer said so many years ago, and I've quoted him a few times and gotten <laughs> ragged on in iTunes, <laughs> refused because I say this, flying saucers are here to make us think. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be the case. I mean, you can look at every paranormal phenomenon that it always, we never quite get to resolving it. We never quite, you know, can confirm what a ghost is, you know, is it a projection of the mind? Is it really somebody come back? You know, we don't know. It's the same with the UFOs. It's the same with the Loch Ness Monster, the Yeti, you know, Roswell, Kenneth Arnold. It, it's the same period. They're always one step away from us and we never quite get it. Like the TV show, One Step Beyond. So what do we do? What's going to happen in the UFO field? Is there anything well, we can do to break out as you say, break out of its total failure to have ever achieved anything solid? Well, I think, you know, some people might, if they agree with me, they might say, well, what's the point of doing anything else? And I can understand that. But for me, that's a defeatist, weak approach. Um, I think what we should do is further our studies in terms of looking outside this carefully delineated it's E.T. coming to steal our DNA because their race is dying angle. You know, we need to look totally outside the box at some of the really fringe areas and dig into them as deeply as possible because I think we stand a chance of getting some answers versus just more and more reports and more and more filing cabinets and more and more memory sticks, you know, which don't really answer anything. So we need to think outside the box. If we don't, you know, ufology won't be dead 100 years from now. They'll just 